Okay, welcome back. And um, <clears throat> if there's any questions, if you pondered anything or thought about anything uh, during lunch, um, just either raise your hand or let's see. Either raise your hand or just uh, well, write a question. Uh, thanks for your nice comment, Debbie. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about um, uh, breast conditions. Now, there was a comment, I think, a while ago uh, from a student. Why is there so much acute care homeopathy dealing with women's conditions, childbearing, etc.? Mainly because that's a very hot topic during uh, pregnancy and child rearing that women do not want to take al harmful allopathic medications. They want to be taking uh, very healthy uh, substances that are going to stimulate their body to heal. And of course, with uh, breast conditions, uh, mastitis can be an issue uh, whenever you're nursing a child. And I am particularly happy that I reviewed this material because I have three goats that I'm milking. And uh, one of the goats developed uh, mastitis. And I prescribed <coughs> phytolacta, which is a remedy listed here. And uh, my goodness, uh, the condition resolved um, within a couple of hours with phytolacta. So even though, um, you know, my wife isn't pregnant and she's not nursing, I have uh, 40 goats out there, uh, 13 of which are nursing. So homeopathy is something I'm actively using for all of my animals. So we have three uh, main remedies for mastitis. And if you wanted to see where this is in your Kent's repertory, uh, you go uh, to chest chapter, inflammation. And I wonder if you could pull out your book, Inflammation Mammae. And in the inflammation chapter begins on page 835. And he has inflammation, uh, bronchial tubes, inflammation of the heart, inflammation of the lungs. And at the bottom of page 836, inflammation of mammae. And you can see the bold remedies are belladonna, baronia, hepar, phytolacta, silica, and sulfur. And then later on, there's also inflammation of uh, the pleura. Now, one of the nice things about homeopathy is that, you know, you've had all of these remedies already in for different um, other conditions. Um, oh, uh, Debbie has another question. How do you give a remedy to animals with skin itching and red spots or fungus when you can't take a case? Uh, that's a good question. So what you need to do, you can take a case for an animal. I have 50 goats, and I think every goat has a little bit different personality. So you go to the mind section, and you look up rubrics, and sometimes you have to use your imagination. You know, if the goat doesn't listen to you, there's no rubric, a goat doesn't listen, but there is something called, uh, you know, stubborn. And um, maybe uh, the goats have a lot of fear, fear of movement. So you do do fear. So what you need to do with the animals, um, you have to look at structurally, maybe how they're different. Are they thin? Are they overweight? Um you have to look at the mental, emotional, so maybe their facial features. So there's so many things that you can do. You want to find the unique characteristics of the animal. 
you know, we talked about miasms and um, every miasm has a whole set of unique features. So, you know, you may want to look at what is the miasm with the goat or with your animal you're treating with a rash. And uh, then, um, you know, look at the rubric, um, skin eruptions, itching, and, um, you know, red spots, eruptions, red, etc. And you'll probably come to uh, maybe four or five different homeopathic remedies. And then just use your best judgment, maybe based on the temperament or personality of that remedy and, and give it a try. Um, and uh, you'd, you'd be surprised. Uh, remedies, homeopathic remedies work extremely well in the animals. I think even better than humans because the animals haven't been subjected to a lot of the suppressions that we have. Suppression not only from our food, heavy metal poisoning, antibiotics, immunizations. Of course, you can't say that with all animals. I know the animals we have on our ranch here in Florida I'm avoiding any type of immunizations, any type of petrochemical. They're strictly organic. I had a parasite problem and I'm treating the parasites with diatomaceous earth, you know, no dewormers. Um, and there's another part of that question. Uh, how long, one time or three days? Well, for an animal, uh, it's just like a human. I would give one dose to see what happens. Uh, you may want to repeat it in a low potency um, to see what happens, but I would certainly wouldn't use a high potency. I'd use something like a 6C or a 30C, maybe give it for a couple of days. But the best thing in homeopathy for treating any condition, give the remedy and wait. Give the remedy and wait. Okay, so let's look at our three main remedies. And um, belladonna is a remedy that we've covered before. And immediately when you hear the word belladonna, some things um, should come to your mind. And um, I'm hoping to get a little bit more interaction. So does somebody want to raise their hand and tell me what comes to their mind? when you hear uh, Belladonna. If I don't hear a, see a hand go up, I'm gonna have to call on somebody. Um, uh, Sue, are you there? Yes, okay. can you what, hear me? I hear you fine. So what comes to your mind when you hear a Belladonna? The hot and heat, you know, yeah. inflammation. I mean, that, I guess that's what that would be. So. Okay, and how about the pace of Belladonna? hot and heat, but all these remedies have a certain pace. So when, when Belladonna, is it something that comes on quickly or is it something that comes on slowly? Uh, quickly. Very good. Very good. So Belladonna, and of course in uh, mastitis, you're going to, thanks Sue. So Thank you. in Belladonna, you, it is going to come on very quickly. It's going to be hot, uh, red, and also uh, sensitive to touch. So um, this is a, a particular remedy that uh, we, we think of, um, you know, for any type of acute condition, any type of problem that comes on suddenly where there's a lot of heat, inflammation, redness. So you can have a belladonna conjunctivitis. You can have a belladonna ear infection. You can have a belladonna otitis media. You can have a belladonna abscess. Um, you know, this is a great homeopathic remedy to have in your first aid kit. And you can very effectively treat acute problems. Your child so suddenly develops a high temperature at night. Um, with a, a red face, a throbbing headache, you know, it's belladonna. And you'll be shocked to find out how well belladonna works. Now, baronia, uh, we've also had uh, uh, byronia before. And uh, Miss Debbie, what can you say about, uh, Debbie, are you there? What can you say about baronia? 
Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind that you told us was if you're thinking of something that's mucous membranes. Okay, Baronia is big for the mucous membranes, but not so much where the membrane affects. What is the unique nature of um, Baronia? It has a unique nature. There's some certain features of Baronia that make it unique, and that's what you need to know um, yeah. about each one of these remedies. Well, I know you also said it was sensitive for motion. Right. Very, very sensitive to motion. Um, that uh, even putting um, your hand on the patient's bedside and moving it that slightly will get them irritated. And that they wanted to be left alone. Like, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't know if that's a characteristic of Baronia. That's more of Arnica. Arnica is more as I want to be left alone. Um, they do, they do like to be left alone mainly because they don't like to be touched or carried. So, like children that have a baronia, they dislike to be held, and they're very irritable. Very. Irritable. I know you also talked about there was some problems with um, the stomach, the gastrointestinal. Um, think they they're very thirsty. Thirsty for large quantities of water. That's uh, that's a characteristic, and they tend to be very dry. So you know, to me, uh, a baronia breast problem um, uh, would be extremely sensitive to touch or motion. So in an animal or a person, a human that had a mastitis, you know, the slightest motion, you know, would cause a lot of irritation then extremely thirsty, um, you know, dryness. Uh, okay, but, then I must, have, I must have been thinking of dry mucous membrane then. Yeah, they have dry lips. Uh, lips are parched and dry. Extreme, extreme excessive uh, thirst. Um, all the mucous membranes are dry, especially the lips. Uh, they're also irritable. Uh, of course, belladonna can be irritable too. And I don't think that baronia comes on as quickly. It doesn't come on as quickly as um, um, uh, belladonna. But the thing is that um, uh, the main characteristic is motion or movement aggravates. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Okay, and then the last one is uh, Phytolacta. And Phytolacta is, I don't know if you're familiar, it's a bush called pokeweed. Um, it grows in the northeast area of the United States, or poke root. It's like a maybe a six to an eight foot high bush with uh, blue berries, and the berries really stain. And... Um, Phytolacta is a really, it's a big glandular remedy uh, using for treating any type of glandular swelling. And it's also a uh, syphilitic remedy. So there tends to be more uh, destruction. But uh, Phytolacta has a strong affinity to um, the breasts, uh, not only tumors of the breasts, cancers of the breasts. Um, so phytolacta and I treated my goats with phytolacta and, you know, maybe I was just lucky or that it worked really well. Um, I just remembered from my homeopathic study that phytolacta is the number one remedy for uh, breast conditions, but these are the three ones to uh, consider. Um, you can also uh, look under uh, abscesses in your repertory. Um, so let's go to, let's see. I think there's, you can look under generals. So if you have your Kent's repertory, let's go to generals abscess and see what's there.
Um, so there is, in generalities, there's abscesses, calcarea iodatum, calcarea sulf, hepar, lachesis, mercury, silica. There's a whole bunch of uh, remedies, and there's also abscesses of the glands. So that's a good place to look for any type of abscess. Then we can look under chest, abscess, mammae. So let's see what's there. Chest. And I hope all of you have your repertory out. You're turning with me. Um, chest. Yeah, abscess mammae. And we have hepar, mercury, phosphorus, phytolacta, silica, sulfur. And there's abscesses of the nipples. Oh, one thing I have to share with you at this homeopathic meeting. I mean, these were some of the most uh, brilliant um, homeopaths in the world were there. But the consensus from all of them was there's so much material in the repertory. You know, you pick up Kent's repertory and we're reading it. And everybody there felt that the only way to learn homeopathy is turning the pages of the repertory and uh, reading, you know, these, about these, uh, these little rubrics and the remedies in the rubrics. So I know that there's been a lot of interest with you about getting computers and doing your work. But as a student and uh, learning homeopathy, there's nothing better for you than uh, turning the pages of the repertory, learning what is there, and also understanding, you know, what each word means in terms of, um, uh, you know, that particular situation. So... Okay, there's other remedies uh, listed here. There's borax, graphites, hepar sulf, philodendron, mercurius viva, and uh, silica. And all these um, are remedies to consider. And I think we're going to go, wait, let's back up. Okay, let's go here to uh, plugged ducts. Aconite, hepar sulf silica or sulfur. Now, you know, as you study the Materia Medica and learn more, you know, there's certain thoughts that should come into your mind as you, uh, you know, go through each remedy. So aconite, um, we already studied as a big remedy for colds and flus. It comes on after exposure to, you know, dry cold wind. Uh, it also has a fast pace. We also le learned that there's um, uh, a lot of fears associated with aconite. So these are maybe some ancillary indications. Now, how about hepar sulf? Um, so let's, why don't we go into boracy? Let's say you're considering hepar sulf. And uh, I think these notes and these list of remedies are really important. Uh, you should organize them and kind of have them in, you know, your first aid uh, manual. So, you know, if you do have a condition, then you just simply look here at the, at the remedy dif differential. So I'm looking at Hepar Sulf. And in my work, it starts on 261. Uh, glandular uh, swellings, eruptions, great sensitive, great sensitivity to all impressions, uh, tendency to separation is most marked, and has been a strong guiding symptom in practice. Chilliness and hypersensitivity, splinter-like pain. So one thing that may differentiate hepar is uh, the tendency to separation, discharge, and also uh, coldness, chilliness, and hypersensitivity. <coughs> of course, uh, belladonna 
can be hypersensitive uh, also, but the belladonna tends to be hot. Um, so heap ourself tendency to separation. Silica is also a remedy for abscesses separation, especially uh, a long standing. The silica is one of the main remedies, uh, along with HEPAR and along with Staphylococcus agria uh, for styes of the eye. But each one has a little bit, di little bit different uh, characteristics. So let's look up silica on page 474. And um, diseases of bone carry silica can stimulate the orb to reabsorb. Just glancing through this. Ill effects of vaccination. Uh, great sensitivity of taking cold. Chilly, cold. When I th think of silica, I think of someone that has like lack of energy, sluggishness, cold. Um, so, um, you know, kind of like this slowness. So a plug duct that has silica um, because of stasis and slowness. Um, so let's look here. Um, coldness over the whole bodies. Nipples very sore. I'm reading under female on page 475. Uh, icy cold over the whole body. Ulcerated, easily drawn in. Fibrous ulcers. So possibly this idea of fibrous, so more of scarring. And of course, silica is a, a, a big remedy of um, scar tissue, fibrous, indurated tumors, more of a keloid growth, more of a hardness. Uh, sulfur is a remedy that we had before, is, um, is a warm remedy. It's a big skin remedy, a lot of heat, tendency to abscesses and problems. So as you look at um, a certain condition, it's nice to just look at each remedy, uh, maybe turn into Boriki and read about it. And the two, two areas that you should read are the first paragraph that uh, kind of gives you like an overview and then maybe read the mind section and then also the particular area of the body uh, that you're honing in on. Uh, by that, I mean, you know, breast conditions, you would look under chest or female. Okay, so now let's go to inadequate milk. Uh, silica is one that's listed. I also consider uh, lac defloratum. Lactifloratum is skim milk, homeopathic remedy, skim milk from the cow, which in a, may, in a way makes sense because many times in homeopathy, we take the substance that's involved with the pathology to stimulate. Uh, calcarea carbonica, urtica uh, urins, urins. Um, so what does urtica Orins have to do with inadequate milk. So let's look at our book. And anytime you do have a question in your mind, is use this as an opportunity for learning. So let's look up Urtica. Now that's the stinging nettle. And the first sentence there is a remedy for a glactia and lithiasis, which is kind of interesting. Uh, rheumatism associated with urticaria like eruptions, neuritis. So it is listed as one of the top remedies for a glactia, which is an absence of milk and stones, which to be quite honest with you, I um, didn't remember that. <coughs> so now um, this is something I'm going to remember simply because I looked it up in Boriki and read it. And if you go into female, diminish secretion of milk. So I'm going to remember these remedies because um, I got three milking goats and uh, one has uh, had a marked decrease, decretion of milk production. 
So I uh, might consider one of these remedies, uh, you know, depending on the nature of the goat. So I'm just not going to jump right in to urtica urines. Uh, I may consider calcarea carbonica, lacti or silica, depending on, um, you know, the nature and how other things uh, fit. Um, also, respiratory chest milk disappearing or chest milk absent. <laughs> so that's in the repertory. And that's a rubric that I've never heard of. Of course, I'm an eye doctor. I'm not involved in treating mastitis or decrease in milk. But this has an interest for me now since I have some milking goats. So chest milk. Yeah, I'll be darned. If you look at page 838, there's actually a sub rubric. Chest milk. Stringy suppressed, thick and taste bad, thin, weaning after, and yellow. So look at all those subcategories. Now, this would be something that I would have never, never have learned uh, using a computer. Uh, you know, and you have to know the repertory. And this is just like a wealth of information. Milk suppressed, thick and taste bad, thin, thin and blue, thin and salty, thin and watery. Um, so, uh, I think our repertory is amazing. And the thing is, you gotta, you gotta read it. You gotta go through it. Uh, and that's the only way that you're really going to learn. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, go on breast conditions, uh, drying up the milk. Pasatilla, lax C, chest milk increased to perfuse. Um, and a cracked nipple nipples, use topical calendula. And I think we already talked about that, that calendula is a really good, it comes in homeopathic ointment, a low potency, like a 3X or a 6X. Or you can actually use the, um, uh, you know, the herbal preparation. The calendula is excellent for treating skin problems without worrying about suppression. So instead of treating the cracked nipples with an antibiotic ointment or perhaps a steroid cream, which is definitely a no-no, is um, to use uh, calendula. Um Main remedy is castor equi, uh, or consider hepar sulf and silica for cracked nick nipples. Now let's look up in Boraki castor equi. Uh, this is a remedy that we haven't really covered. <laughs> And um, I have it on page 144. This is a rudimentary thumbnail of the horse. As a general action on thickening of the skin and epithelium. Highly useful remedy in cracked and ulcerated nipples. Affects principally female organs. Acts on the nails and bones. Warts on the forehead. Warts on the breast. Um, so based on this business with warts, I would think that this is a psychotic remedy, a remedy of proliferation. Uh, the action is on thickening of the skin and epithelium. So cracks or thinness of the skin, castor equi. Okay. And then also in our room, uh, in our repertory, there's a section, chest, cracks, mammi, nipple. And that is, um, let's see, chest, cracks. I have cracking, cracks of nipples, a bottom of 828, cracks of nipples. Our Kent's repertory 
should have the same pages. So Okay, so mine is chest cracks of nipples and Castor Equi is there, 828. Okay, let's talk a little, now move on to dysmenorrhea. Any questions on uh, what we covered so far? Okay. So um, you need to rule out pelvic infections or endometriosis, but I'm assuming the, you know, run of the mill dysmenorrhea that comes every month, uh, it should be considered um, an acute treatment. Although um, in many cases when the dysmenorrhea is recurring, it has to be treated more as a uh, constitutional case. But in my personal experience, uh, treating, treating uh, dysmenorrhea, it has been very successful if you follow uh, the guidelines listed below. Number one question you should ask is, when does the pain occur? Um, and you have three choices, before, during, or after the menses. Um, and once you determine that, what is the nature of the pain? Is it uh, a gripping pain, a shooting pain, a throbbing pain? Because remember, um, every type of pain has a uh, certain association, you know, with with remedies. So if it's a dull pain, or there'll be certain remedies for that. If it is a um, burning pain, you have certain remedies and the question might be is where are you going to learn the characteristics of the pain well if you go into the general section let's go into generals and pain look up pain and we can learn about the different types of pain and you can see because pain is a symptom we have many, many pages on pains. So we have pain grad, appear, appearing gradually and disappearing gradually. We have pain appearing suddenly. We have our friend Belladonna. We have our pain in bones. We have our pain at night in glands. We have benumbing pain, boring pain. Uh, we have burning pain, and burning pain, if you look at the bottom of page 1378, burning pain, we have apis and arsenicum. Apis is the bumblebee. Their pains are typically burning, and arsenicum tends to be burning. <coughs> we have pains that are constricting externally, constricting internally. And we see some of the big remedies, platina and pulsatilla. We have pains that are cutting uh, internally and externally. We have pains that are digging. We have pains that are drawing, jerking, paralytic pains, pinching pains. Uh, we have pressing pains. So you want to just, we have radiating pain, sore, bruised sensation. Um, Splinters, stitching, stitching externally, stitching downward, stitching inward, uh, transversely upward, burning in the muscles, tearing in the muscles, pain muscle cramps. So how can you use this for dysmenorrhea? Well, you can combine a rubric uh, in the generality section for the particular pain and then match it uh, with the dysmenorrhea. Uh, Debbie, did you have a question? Yes, and I, I, I hope I'm not disrupting and this isn't related, but I get a lot of people that come to see me that get pain from a certain bug bite. 
and it's uh, kind of overwhelming where to start with the pain because the pain is so big, the section. Well, it's big because just about every homeopathic remedy can manifest with pain. So, you know, if it's a bug bite, you know, that would limit you to a certain group of homeopathic remedies. Now, the first remedy that comes to my mind is Leadum. Leadum is the number one homeopathic remedies for bites or insect bites. That doesn't mean that Leadum is going to treat it, but that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Then you need to find out how they're reacting to it. Uh, is it just pain? Is there a lot of swelling? Is there redness? And you take those symptoms. So it could be belladonna. If there's a marked amount of swelling and there's redness and tenderness to touch, it could be belladonna. It could be baronia. It could be any homeopathic remedy. It depends on how the body responds. The way to find out the homeopathic remedy is to find out how the body responds. Just like when you do, when you're taking a, a, a case and trying to treat dysmenorrhea, uh, you know, how does the body respond to the dysmenorrhea? And we're talking about when the pain occurs, uh, nature of the pain, nature of the flow, etc. So that's what you need to do. Thank you. Okay. All right. So anyway, let's look here. Uh, nature of the pain. What is the nature of the flow? Heavy, light, clotted, or thin? And where do you find that? Well, we go into the section on female. Genitalia female. And uh, there's going to be a section on menses. And uh, let's see. That begins on page um, 724. And uh, you could see acrid menses on that page, black. Uh, bright red, clotted, copious, and uh, you can see dark, uh, fluid, blood-containing clots. So there's just a wealth of symptoms here, um, pitch-like, etc. So how long is the menses? And once again, in that section there, you can look under uh, time duration. I think it's prolonged, menses copious, menses offensive, protracted, um, or scanty, short duration. So we have particular rubrics. How regular is the menses? Is there PMS associated? And are there emotional factors? And of course, you can look in the mind section, um, you know, for those particular symptoms and kind of put everything together. Kind of put everything together. Okay, female pain menses. Um, before, during, and after. So that's a key one because it's not, you have to get used to the order of the repertory. So it's not female menses pain, it's female pain. So genitalia, female pain. And uh, let's see where the menses is. See, pain ovaries. Uh, let's see, uterus pain bearing done. Okay, so pain. There's menses before. We have china croak lycopodium platina. So it's in that section near pain menses before. 
Um, abdominal pain, menses, you can look there in the subrubrics. Uh, main remedies are belladonna, calcarb, lachesis, metarinum, mex vomica, pulsatilla, and sepia. So these are the main remedies for dysmenorrhea. And all of these have certain characteristics that um, uh, are unique. So we know that belladonna has a rapid onset. Um, it has redness. Uh, swelling, uh, calcarea carbonica, lachesis metarinum, they all have uh, a certain uniqueness to them. Lachesis, for example, the menstrual pain is relieved with the flow. So typically they get a lot of pain uh, before the period. And once the blood flow starts, then the pain goes away. And that's characteristic for all of the lachesis pain. It's always better uh, from a discharge. So a lachesis sore, sore throat is better with a discharge. Um, a lachesis bladder infection is bled, better urinating, always better from a discharge. Now, some of these other, I'm not that familiar, um, but the best way to find out is if you're studying the remedies, how is a calcarea carbonica dysmenorrhea? So what we would do is go to Boraki and uh, look up calcarea carbonica, which is on page 117. And um, we could look on the female. It has here before menses, headache, colic, chilliness, and leucorrhea. Cutting pain in uterus during menstruation. Menses too early, too profuse, too long, with vertigo, toothache, and cold, damp feet. The least excitement causes their return. Um, so now we got some idea on the characteristics of a calcarea carbonica. Um, now let's go to metarinum. The thing is, when you do study Materia Medica, metarinum, metarinum begins on page 340 in Borici. Uh And here it states intense pruritus or itching, menses offensive, dark, clotted, stains, difficult to wash, urinates frequently at that time. Uh, fishy odor, psychotic warts on genitals. So we now have a picture of um, metarinum. But see, not only are you studying Materia Medica for dysmenorrhea, you're studying it for every other condition. So it's just a certain feature of the homeopathic remedy. So let's look, Nux vomica under female. Menses too early, lasts too long, always irregular, black blood with faint spells, uh, pain in the sacrum, constant urging to stole. Um, let's look up pulsatilla. Okay, pulsatilla uh, under female. And that's page 432. Uh, suppressed menses from wet feet. Nervous debility. Too late, scant, thick chilliness, nausea, downward pressure. Diarrhea during or after menses. So there's an, uh, another complete picture here uh, that makes the pulsatilla dysmenorrhea a little bit different. Um, also, um, Pulsatilla has a unique uh, disposition, especially for mild, gentle, yielding disposition. Sad, crying readily, weeps when talking. So that is a characteristic. <laughs> Sepia is a big female remedy. 
so let's go to sepia and see what we have for sepia uh, under female and now i'm looking at the top of page 472 pelvic organs relaxed bearing down sensation if everything would escape through the vulva leucorrhea yellow greenish minces too late and scanty irregular early profuse sharp clutching pain prolapse of uterus and vagina so we have this um, characteristic of the pelvic organs are relaxed menses are late and scanty irregular so another characteristic uh, feature so um, you know when you're studying um, use these as kind of guidelines or a springboard springboard to go in and to begin to read these uh, read about these uh, remedies and to see what the unique characteristics are that it all has to do with repetition <laughs> you may have to do it 20 or 30 times and you'll discover aha next vomica they seem to always be irritable they're chilly you know they're impatient so and you know they have uh, certain types of pain you know so the more the more you apply the particular remedy to a physical condition you're going to find out that there's certain similarities that will help you apply that remedy to just any condition so as i study the materia medica for the eye even though i'm learning it for the eye it can be applied for any other condition in the body okay so let's go into some particular remedies for dysmenorrhea belladonna pain uh, worse before but mainly during S a feeling of sudden bearing down feeling pressing and feeling of the vulva pains radiate downwards feels like labor string around the uterus uh, copious and heavy flow clot followed by a gush violent bleeding and you know belladonna seems to have this violent violent characteristic pain with clots profuse with bright red blood aggravated motion walking jarring ameliorated lying or flexing the limbs so baronia has this aggravated motion uh, but i don't think it is as, as intense as the belladonna and of course we're not surprised of the violent bleeding profuse with the bright red blood uh, all these things are a characteristic of belladonna uh, calc carb um, swelling of the breasts before the menses and it has other cal calcarea characteristics and we already talked about calcarea uh, another time can anybody uh, out there raise their hand and tell me what are the characteristics of calcarea carbonica uh, Abe are you there Dr. Abe? Yeah. Characteristics of calcar calcarea carbonica. What kind of things come to your mind? Um, In fact, if you don't know, pull out Boricky and turn to the page. I don't know if you're reading or if you're just reciting it from memory. I will need to pull it out. <laughs> Should have it right in front of you, because that's what yeah. I do. All you yeah. guys, all you guys think I'm real smart, but I just have the book in front of me and I'm reading. Uh, let's see, apprehensive. Um, where am I? Let 
the most important paragraph is uh, if you look at Calcare Kobanik in the beginning, is um, children who grow fat are large bellied with large head, pale skin, chalky look. You know the typical picture of a baby that looks like a little cherub, like an angel? And great sensitivity to cold, sweats. And the calcarea patient is fat, fair, flabby, and perspiring and cold, damp, and sour. So that sentence right there kind of sums it up. Fat, fair, flabby, perspiration, cold, damp, and sour. Okay. So this would be much different because lachesis is the next remedy. And lachesis is just the opposite. You know, they're a warm remedy. They're thin. But calcarea carbonica is probably one of the most commonly prescribed homeopathic remedies. And it's a remedy that, you know, you really got to get into the back of your head. It's also a big remedy for the eye, you know, dry eyes. If you look at the eye section there, lacrimal ducts close from exposure to cold. So these, these are people that are, you know, fair, fat, flabby, cold. So if you have that person come in and have lacrimal ducts that are blocked or watering, spots or ulcers on the cornea, chronic dilation of the pupils, cataracts, it's a big remedy for cataracts, dimness of vision. So, you know, not only are there certain physical things, it's, you know, their presentation, you know, when they walk in. Okay, thank you. Thank you, doctor. All right, so um, lachesis is a left-sided uh, remedy, worse on the left side. And I was taught early on that a left eye hemorrhage is uh, lachesis. A right eye hemorrhage is crotalis horridus. So left ovary. Um, so uh, that would be a keynote. You know, dysmenorrhea, worse on the left side. The other big thing with lachesis is much better when the flow starts. They get extremely um, severe pains, but as soon as that period begins, as soon as the flow begins, the pain goes away. And that is like lachesis until proven otherwise. They can also have other um, symptoms, violent headaches. Severe premenstrual symptoms with anger, jealousy. Lachesis is a big and emotional remedy. So these are people that can have major mental and emotional, major mental and um, um, uh, emotional problems, you know, before the period. So lachesis is a really big remedy for that. Uh, Metarhinum. Intense colicky kind of pain, similar to Nux. Uh, wanting to press their feet hard against something passionate, do things in excess. Um, uh, but Nux vomica also it can be passionate. They can do things in excess, and they have this colicky type of pain. Uh, but the unique thing is wanting to press their feet hard against something uh, to eliminate the pain. Nux vomica has this cramping type of pain, uh, but Nux vomica now is a big remedy for cramps anywhere. You know, night cramps, cramps in your arms, cramps in your belly. So, you know, it has this unique type of uh, cramping. Worse before and during the period. So it's not eliminated when the flow begins. Very chilly, uh, better heat. And Nux is irritable, ameliorated pressure, um, bending double. So where metarhinum is ameliorated, pressing their feet hard against something, uh, Nux vomica is ameliorated, 
uh, with pressure over the abdomen or are bending double. Bending double. So, pulsatilla, pain before and during the menses, uh, early menses. No two menses are alike. A key word for pulsatilla is changeable. Uh, in other words, their symptoms change. Their description changes. They're constantly changing. Uh, that should be highlighted and embedded in your mind for pulsatilla. Uh, changeable, changeable symptoms. Uh, no two menses are alike. So they're going to describe each one being uh, slightly different. Um, increased sexual desire uh, during the period and swelling of the breasts. Uh, sepia is another big female remedy. Uh, bearing down type of pain, pelvic organs will fall out, leucorrhea or vaginitis, irritability, um, uh, aggravated walking and standing. Uh, sepia has this theme of laxity of, of, uh, of tissues and of organs. So not only is there laxity of the pelvic organs, but if you think of the eye, there may be laxity or weakness of the eyelids, you know, ptosis of the eyelids or drooping of the eyelids. It's just the tone uh, decreases. So that's a, a characteristic of sepia that goes through, um, you know, all of the symptoms associated with it. Okay, uh, questions on um, uh, breast problems or dysmenorrhea. I think that homeopathy can be extremely effective in helping to treat uh, dysmenorrhea. And uh, if, you, if you use some of the guidelines that I outlined, it should be fairly, fairly easy, easy to treat. Um, so questions from you folks. Anybody have any questions? Okay, uh, uh, Miss Debbie, you have a question? I'm sorry to be a pest, but I always have questions. <laughs> um, I, for me, it's just transferring this great information you give us, which drove me crazy when you did a whole day of pregnant women, or we talk about a goat's breast milk not working right, and how I take this brilliant information and just apply it more to the real everyday people that we're going to see in our practice. That's the harder part for me to transfer it over. So when you give us little hints, like, um, you know, this is a big emotional remedy and for cataracts and dry eyes and headaches, that helps me more rather than talking about the goat's breast or the, you know, the pregnant girl that typically as a beginner doing this, you wouldn't be, you know, working with those until you're more advanced, in my opinion, but maybe it's just me. Well, who knows? You may have a goat come in tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, out of my 2100... Out of my 2,100 clients, they're always asking me, what do I do for my dog's skin itching? Everybody's skin is itching. Well, so, then, you know, a goat's an animal. I mean, they may yeah. come in and ask you for mastitis, but yeah, the homeopathic, I, the homeopathic principles pass through the species and they pass through different organs. So even though, um, you know, we're talking about mastitis, which you may never see a case or dysmenorrhea, uh, you know, the principles are there. And I think one of the reasons why that this course, this acute course, has emphasized female problems is because women that are pregnant and are having children want to use more natural means. So this is one big area that homeopathy works well, and it works very effectively, and it can really help tremendously. But 
uh, just remember that the principles, the nature, the characteristics of the remedy, whether you're studying them for breast problem or an eye problem, they have a lot of the same characteristics and features. Yeah, I do understand. It's just it's just getting the beginner person learning this. How you then transfer that information to the the normal clinic person that I would see in my clinic, maybe one out of two hundred is pregnant. You know, it's it's not the general population well, that you know, I would see. Maybe I'm these, different. No, even though these remedies, hey, I I I my age group's over the age of sixty five, but when yeah. I'm studying, um you know, breast problems and dysmenorrhea, you can apply them to an eye problem. Let's say if they have an eye problem that comes in and um, the pain in the eye goes away when they get the eye discharge. Okay, when I begin to have an eye discharge, the pain goes away. Let's say they tell me that symptom. Well, I studied that remedy in dysmenorrhea. The pain goes away uh, whenever the period begins. What remedy is that? We covered that. Do you remember? Uh, eye discharge. No, I've got dry no, eye, but I'm not. No, no. Forget about the eye discharge. We studied a remedy in dysmenorrhea. It was a couple slides ago. It's the characteristic of this remedy. And I said, anytime there's a discharge, the symptoms will get better. So in dysmenorrhea, they get pain before the period. But once the blood flow, which is a discharge, the pain goes away. So I'm saying is that information is valuable because somebody comes with you that has an eye problem or uh, they tell you, um, you know, I got, um, uh, you know, an eye problem, but when the eye, when it begins to discharge or my eye begins to water, the pain goes away. There can be any symptom that has a discharge where the pain goes away or the symptom gets better. So, okay. Okay. That makes it clear for me. Thank you. So every, every, every remedy that we study has that application anywhere in the body. You have to think uh, metaphorically or use your imagination. So the remedy I'm talking about is lachesis. So if somebody comes in with uh, an eye problem, they got severe pain, and I go, when does the pain get better or when does the pain get worse? And they say, well, every time I get a lot of discharge, the pain goes away. But when the discharge stops, the pain gets worse. That's a lachesis symptom. And I learned that because I was studying dysmenorrhea, women's periods. But I don't come in, you know, pe females with dysmenorrhea don't come to see me. Okay. Okay. There's, All right. There's, good. There's, there's universe universality in homeopathy. Everything can be applicable to something else, and that's the beauty of homeopathy. It's not like you've got to study a different remedy for the eye compared to dysmenorrhea. So if somebody comes in with um, cracks, dry cracks around their eyelid. I'm going to think, hey, I studied the remedy castor equi, and there's thinning around the cracks. That could be the remedy for that. You follow me? Yes. So that's what the hardest thing to learn in homeopathy. But once you um, um, come to that realization, then homeopathy is wonderful because everything that you study is supportive of many other areas. So just because I'm an eye doctor, I can take that knowledge of treating eyes to any other part of the body. Okay, because I really, and you made it make sense, but I really wasn't thinking as, okay, when the period comes, the pain goes away. But then I didn't take that to understand that, okay, when the eye discharge comes, the eye pain goes away. So thank you for clearing that up. So it can be any discharge. So we can go back into some of these slides. Let's say, you know, there can be cracks in the eyelid. Remember, I castor equi, I thought of that. Um, so inadequate milk, you know, silica, 
calcareous carpet, they can be inadequate in a lot of different things. Adequate, you know, production of hormones. Um, you know, <laughs> you follow me, their estrogen is low. So, you know, this inadequacy or decrease in secretion could also be <coughs> um, considered for hormonal dysfunction. So these remedies have a, um, a certain universal aspect, which is probably the most important thing to understand in homeopathy. But once you do, and, and then things begin to come together in your homeopathic studies. Well, well that, makes, that makes a lot of sense, so thank you for explaining that. I just couldn't make the jump was, okay, well, if you don't have too many women that come in that are talking about periods being blocked, then how do you apply that to other things? And you answered that. Thank you. Okay, good. So this, all, this stuff, all this stuff is important, and that's why the American Medical College of Homeopathy, you're required to take this acute care course before you move on and most of the doctors that take it you know don't treat women's problems but in order to learn homeopathy you have to learn the certain universal application of these these homeopathic so the next section is going to be immunizations uh, which i think is such an important issue in our country uh, there's no question that we're being over immunized and uh, these, this over immunization is just leading to a whole sequelae of problems that are creeping up and including the earlier discussion I had of the aluminum miasm that most children by the age of five have, have had 50 times the safe value of alumina. Alumina is now used as an adjuvant in a lot of um, the um, immunizations and, and vaccinations, in addition to having antiperspirants and aluminum cookware, etc. So if you want to get a handle on this, if you have children or grandchildren, these are the list of books that you should definitely uh, uh, read, um, and they're really just uh, mind-blowing when you look at all the detail. As far as I'm concerned, immunizations don't do a darn thing. Let's see. Uh, Sue, did you have a question? Um, yes, I did. I'm sorry. I know this could be somewhat repetitive. We've covered it in the past and on our slides and stuff, but in how can you just kind of tell us in your words how do you go about dosing um in general is there a kind of a format that you follow? well i think i think probably the best thing to do is you know as a beginner you're always better off going with a lower potency and with uh, our 30x 30, is that is it i think safe? it's a 30c your kit should I mean, be 30c 30. Okay. yeah the 30c is a good level it's kind of like an intermediate, you know, it's not too low or too high. Uh -huh. Now, earlier I talked about treating um, heavy metal poisoning with homeopathy. At if six, six C, yeah. I would yeah. use a six C. I think it's critical not to take a 30 C every day. That could uh -huh. be dangerous. You'd want to take a so six C every day. Six C should be safe. So like in a, a situation where they're having, say, those breast problems or whatever, would you say, to, would you give them the 30C like three or four times a day? Or? Oh, no. I just give 30C once and see what happens. Okay. Just because you give a 30C doesn't mean it's going to be more powerful. Okay. I would, then, give, a, I would give a 30C and just to see what happens. And what, what if it's like a chronic or recurring problem? Um, well, see, they're always tougher to treat chronic and recurring because that goes more into a constitutional problem. See, when you're dealing with an acute, now it's different if they get maybe every, by, by recurring, let's say maybe they get uh, mastitis with every child they've had and every two years they get mastitis. That's a little bit different 
then well, for uh, instance, my daughter-in-law's getting it like every three or four weeks. She's getting what? Mastitis. Okay, is she actively nursing now. Yes, but they pump these days so much, you know. Instead of just and they they nurse and then they pump. She has twins, and so you know, I don't know. I well, I just, this is a good opportunity, but I would, um, I I would you know try a thirty C if it helps. Then, um, and it comes back, then I would repeat it. So okay. you listen to the body. Let's say the 30C will help, but two days later it comes back, I'd repeat it. Okay. And then if it lasts two days and she needs it again, I'd repeat it. Then you know you got to take it every three days. And all of a sudden, if you take it again, it doesn't help. And the symptoms haven't changed. I'm just saying that maybe I'd go with a higher potency. Uh -huh. You know, like okay. a 200C. The body okay. needs a little bit more. But typically, if the symptoms are very clear, let's say you, you read phytolacta and you say, oh my God, this is her. This is her to a T. Everything's about it. The symptoms are real strong. Then usually you can go higher. You can go to a and 200, in, you know, 200 or, or a 1M. If the okay. symptoms are very, very clear, you know, now, and, and and, and very is that strong. something else we buy? You know, is that another series of? Uh, you could buy another kit of two hundred. Okay. Uh, but I don't think it's really worth it. I mean, you could do it if you're planning to do a lot of prescribing. But generally right, speaking, right. like so for example, I travel all the time with my thirty C kit, and that's all I need. Okay. And there's some homeopathic doctors. That's all they give is thirty C. Well, if, would you uh, consider doing the 30 and if it didn't work time after time, then just changing the remedy then and seeing if the, to try another one? Yeah. If the 30 C doesn't work, then you're probably instead not the wrong higher. remedy. Yeah. I'm, I mean, within the ones that I have, instead of purchasing the 200 C. Well, you which, have, you have three good remedies for the, you know, the mastitis. Right. Um, you know, and try to find out uh, what the best remedy is. My take would probably be phytolacta would be the best route, best one. Okay. Because it's just recurring. It's it's not like a belladonna where it's coming on quickly. Right. Uh, you know, right. it's it's there all the time. She, you know, keeps on recurring. So it's like an underlying nature in her glands. So the phytolacta. Right. Thank so you. I would, I would try it. Yeah, let us know next class because. Uh, yes, I will. I think she has it going on right now. So I. Uh -huh. Good. It's You'll in my kitchen. Yeah, I'll check and see. Hopefully it's in your kit. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I know I'm looking around for my kit. It should be right here. So I think it's in the other room. But um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so any other questions on dosing, you know, while we're talking about that? Because that may be uh, an area that you're not familiar with uh, or you need some. Debbie, is, that, is your hand up? Okay, so let's say that our kit says 30C and you, you're recommending 6C. Do we dilute it slightly or what would oh, we no. do then? You'd have to buy a 6C. Okay. You can't dilute it. You can't dilute the 30C because actually in homeopathy, if you dilute it, you're making it stronger. Oh, that's right. Yes. It's okay. going to become 100C or something like that. So you can't dilute it. You have to get a 6C. So if, so you, you, are, if you are going you, to uh, treat like alumina or lead or something like that, I would, you know, call up uh, one of the resources that I gave you, the homeopathic, and, you know, buy some 6C. Do you think we should have a kit of 6C? No, I don't have a kit of 6C, but um, I think the 30, my, my kit that I travel with is a 30C, and I'm happy with it. Yeah, and that's what we have too. That's what we bought in the class. Yeah, but you may want to buy some extra 6Cs. I don't think you need a 6C kit because the only time you're going to be taking the remedy every day is for this particular indication of treating heavy metals. So um, you may want to buy Illumina 6C, Mercury 6C, Palumbum or Lead 6C, depending on what heavy metals you're seeing, you know, based on testing that you're doing or maybe reports you got back from your doctor. And then can I also ask you in the doctor's data urine test that we all do, that's only measuring what metal is dropping out of you. It's not measuring what could be stored in the brain or, or your other essential organs. 
so you, sometimes when those come back and they're they're still um, I still feel like there still might be some in the body because that test is only measuring what you're dropping. It's not measure what's stored. How do you feel about that? No, no. The, the test does measure what's stored because you take a provocative agent. And you take, when you take the provocative agent, it draws out the heavy metals in your body, in your brain, your bone, your fat, etc. That's the purpose of that test. Yeah, I understand that, but I thought it was just measuring what was dropped, but it wouldn't really let you know how much is stored left in the body. Well, if it's if it's off the chart, that means there's probably a lot stored, because for the amount of provocative agent that you take, it can only bind so much in the way of heavy metal. So if it's off the chart, that means there's a lot stored in your body. It doesn't mean it's off the chart because it removed everything. So it's a reflection, some indication of how much is stored in your brain and other parts of your body. Now, don't forget, there's a certain false negative too. So when it's in the green area, that's considered within the factor of error. Yes. That okay, thank mean, you. If you have alumina in the green area, that doesn't mean you have alumina in your body. It just could mean that the lab is only so accurate, you know, to measure these trace minerals. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on uh, dosing, um, potencies? Because this is, uh, 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 you know, really important that you're comfortable with this. Uh, I don't think that you need to get a 200C or any other kit. I think the 30C is probably good enough. Um, Craig, did you have a question? Hello? Yeah, I just had a question on, for example, let's say, let's say someone, can you hear me? Yeah, hear you fine. Oh, let's say someone has a motion sickness and you choose, say, tobacco. How soon before someone hops in a car, gets on a boat, would someone need to take that? Well, I, don't, I wouldn't use it uh, prophylactically unless this person always gets car sick or seasick. I would use it whenever the symptoms develop. Let's say you're prone to violent seasickness and you're going to go out on a boat. You know, you may pop some before you get on a boat. That's the only time is I would use it. But is there like a time, like, let's say, you know, you always get on a bus, you always get sick. Is there a time frame? How soon before you hop in a bus or hop on a boat before you put well, the, the remedy home, in? The homeopathic remedy should work instantly. Instantly. Okay. So, you know, I take it. That doesn't mean like you take it like six hours before it's not like it has to be digested into your body like other medications. So I would say a half hour before it should be resonating in your body. Okay. And then you may have to repeat it, um, you know, depending on, on the insult. Okay. Thanks. But uh, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Uh, Debbie, is your hand... Did you forget to put your hand on or do you have another? Oh, probably. I'm done. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, make sure you put your hand on. Craig, I think your hand's still up. So I don't know if you have another question. Okay. Any other questions? So the general rule in homeopathy is when you prescribe a remedy, give them a 30 C and just wait. Uh, if it's an acute case, you should, you should get some type of response almost immediately. In fact, sometimes it, it's almost magical. Um, you know, during this flu epidemic, I, the flu hit me unbelievably hard. I was so weak, I couldn't even stand. In fact, uh, I was in California with my wife and I thought there was an earthquake. I was actually shaking. I mean, I thought, I thought the whole room was shaking and they, my wife was laughing at me. She said, no, there's no earthquake. And my eye, my muscles were weak and uh, my eyelids were weak. I just wanted to, the only thing I wanted to do is just lie down. And I thought it was pretty clear for gelsemium. The moment I took gelsemium, I felt better. It was like instantly, whether it was placebo, I don't care what it was, but I felt better. I was sick and it helped my fever break. And uh, my wife needed a remedy too, but it was different. Uh, she needed baronia because uh, she was very, very irritable. She had a fever. She didn't want to be touched. Any emotion bothered her. And I gave her that. 
and it, it worked almost immediately. It wasn't like we had to wait a day and how do you fill honey? So if it's an acute problem and if the problem is coming on suddenly, quickly, the remedy should take effect quickly too. Um, if, it, if there's no action at all, you might want to wait half an hour to an hour and, you know, give something else, give something else. So it's not like you have to wait a day. Uh, if it's the right remedy, you should have an instant effect. So Craig was asking me about motion sickness. You're out on a boat, you get violently sick. If the backum is going to help, it's going to help immediately. It's not like you take the tobacco and you got to wait an hour, maybe repeat it two or three times. One dose, you're going to know. And the more you begin to play around with homeopathy, you'll um, you'll find out how miraculous it is. I don't know if I told you this the last class, but um, one of my goats was attacked by a dog and it was lying there, hardly breathing. It was almost dead. I poked it. There was like no life. It was just hardly breathing. And I got some carbo vegetabilis, which is the great resuscitator when people are on the throes of death. And I put a couple of pellets under the goat's tongue and immediately, I mean, it was like a split second. The goat just like shook his head, got up till perked up and it ran away. I mean, I wish I would have had that on video. I mean, that would have been amazing but you know you just don't think that homeopathy can work uh that that quickly okay let me see if there's any other questions um i think i answered this already what if what do you do if the 30c is too strong and that's all we have well in most cases the 30c is fine you don't have to worry about it being too strong the only time you do need something less than the 30 seat is that I talked about using homeopathy to remove heavy metals from your body. And I recommend a 6C every day. I don't want you to use the 30 C every day because the 30 C is going to be too strong. And uh, you could actually get proving symptoms by taking the 30 C every day. Uh, so you might want to just get a couple bottles of the 6 C you know, for treating uh, heavy metals. Okay, immunizations, here's a list of books. I would highly encourage you to maybe get one book and read. Um, I, uh, if you want something more historical and more scientific, I would get DPT, A Shot in the Dark by Harris Coulter. Uh, if you want something uh, more for personal decisions. If you want to get immunized yourself, which I hope none of you are, uh, to get the immunization decision by Randall Neustetter. Um, How to raise a healthy child in spite of your doctor is good for mothers. Um, a really good in-depth book is another one by Harris Coulter, The Assault on the American Child, Vaccination, Sociopathy, and Criminality by Harris Coulter. These are all great books. And I think it's important as students in homeopathy, you begin to advise the public of the dangers of immunization. Okay, immunizations are not homeopathy. Uh, so that is something that people confuse. Just because immunizations are a weak solution um, doesn't mean they're homeopathy. Homeopathic medicines are individualized medicines. Immunizations are not individualized. They're given to the entire population without considering individuality. Remedies are also potentized. So when you take a remedy, it's diluted. There's no physical substance present. Immunizations are not diluted. Well, they are diluted, but there's still physical substance present. They have a profound effect on the organism's vitality. And many, many times you'll see somebody, I've never been well since my immunization. Um, and that is a, a rubric that I believe is in the generality section. 
and let me just check on this should be under generalities immunization yeah, let's see i can't find it but it's there somewhere <laughs> never been well since immunization Giving a vaccine is treating one disease for another. There's long-term consequences to immunization. It also suppresses the ability of the body to respond to disease and infection, trading immunity to acute disease by causing a chronic disease. I believe our bodies are meant to get colds and flus. Uh, meant to get colds and flus to strengthen our immune system. So our society as a whole is becoming immunological cripples. Uh, because of this. Two factors in an infection, the etiological agent and the susceptibility. Homeopathy prevents susceptibility. Uh, there is something called homeopathic immunization that with this next, um, with this current a flu epidemic, and I sent you some information on remedy pictures that are occurring throughout the country. For me, Jalsemium seemed to be the remedy picture, although my wife needed Baronia. If, uh, if there is an epidemic coming in your area and everybody's coming down with it, you might want to take a homeopathic remedy as a prophylactic measure. So for me, if I would have taken a 30C Jalsemium, that could have acted prophylactically. Hahnemann called this the genus epidemicus. The genus epidemicus is a picture of um, uh, similar symptoms that the flu produces in people. And once that remedy is identified, that remedy can be a form of prophylaxis or immunization. Um, never been well since immunization. They develop chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, autoimmune disease after flu vaccine. And here it is. It isn't general's immunization. It's general's vaccinosis. So if you have your Kent's repertory, let's open it up to general's vaccinosis. Uh, and there it is, generalities, vaccination, not vaccinosis. And you see after apis, arnica, hepar, calichlorum, maland, silica, sulfur, thuya. Um, in terms of homeopathic studies, thuya seems to be one of the biggest remedies for ailments after vaccination. So vaccinosis is any chronic condition traceable to a vaccination. And uh, this is something important, especially in young people. Uh, there are many cases of uh, autism, uh, paralysis, uh, fibromyalgia, on and on and on that first develop after uh, immunizations or vaccinations. So even at your level of homeopathic training, you can be a godsend to an individual who develops uh, severe sequelae after a uh, vaccination uh, by looking at some of these, the most common remedies, thuya, silica, sulfur, uh, Varolinium is actually made from the smallpox vaccine, mesarium, tuberculinum, uh, melandrium. These are the big remedies after vaccinosis, and you can read about those remedies individually to get a better idea on the indications. Keep the public in the dark. The good of many outweighs the good of the few. National Vaccine Compensation Act, conventional medicine is anxious to prevent which they cannot treat. This is, of course, not true homeopathically, and many diseases are quite treatable. 
the bottom line is the decline of disease was due to better sanitation rather than immunization. We've been misled that immunizations have been the greatest development of modern medicine to prevent mankind from becoming cripples. I think that there probably wasn't one vaccine uh, that cured any disease. One of the biggest misconceptions is the polio vaccine cured polio. And that's a bunch of crap because when the polio vaccine was introduced, polio was already on a decline. And if you look at a graph of the decline, compare a graph of decline of polio in the United States and England, the curve of the decline is identical. If you look at where the polio vaccine was introduced on the American graph, the decline is no different than the English graph. So essentially, the polio vaccine was introduced when polio was dec declining. Even though every school child got the polio vaccine, there was no difference to what happened in England, where they had no uh, vaccine at all. Um, what we're doing now is we're shifting the disease into the older populations uh, because um, we've been partially immunized. We haven't had the exposure of the vaccine uh, where immunological cripples, uh, which the disease is now becoming manifest. I read an article that was really scary that the increased incidence of herpes is related to everyone who got the smallpox vaccine, that the smallpox vaccine is linked to the marked increase in incidence of herpes. Um, immunizations cause atypical forms of the disease to occur, which are more vir vir virulent and more difficult to treat. Um, by the time a vaccine is produced commercially, the virus is already mutated. And we really don't know what we're given and what we're taking into our bodies. The bottom line is, um, you know, it's a different virus. It's a different product. So the uh, vaccine, the immunization is doing nothing. Attempting to eliminate all acute disease leads to the phenomena of suppression. Um, you know, our bodies were meant to get an infection. And if we try to eliminate all acute disease, this can be the highest form of suppression. And maybe this suppression is that is as a result is causing more severe problems, such as Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, etc. Acute disease strengthens the immune system and the vital force. It kind of is like a, an exercise for the immune system and the vital force. Promoting immunity. Unfortunately, uh, breastfeeding is on decline. We have uh, extremely poor nutrition. Um, I don't know if we have good sanitation. Look at the water we're drinking the pesticides and pollutants. Things may be a little bit cleaner in our home, but we're, we're surrounding ourselves with harmful petrochemicals. And uh, our emotional and mental health is declining uh, because of stresses in our environment. So I think immunity is spiraling downward because of the lack of breastfeeding, poor nutrition, um, poor sanitation and lack of good mental and emotional health. Um, side effects of immunizations, lack of reaction. Um, 
so too healthy, the immunizations would engage. Too sick, the pre-existing disease is stronger than the newly introduced immunized disease. So because of this one size fits all, we really don't um, kind of titrate the immunization, you know, depending on the overall health of the individual. Uh, there's also the problems with contaminants uh, in the uh, immunization, such as I mentioned the alumina, uh, the mercury salts, etc. These alone weaken the immune system, which is can have catastrophic effects. So initially, um, the side effects are mild expressions of the symptoms of the disease, fever, irritability, rage, allergic reactions, convulsions, and encephalitis. And delayed reactions include learning disabilities, attention deficit disorders, mental retardation, paralysis, epilepsy, on and on and on. Um, so it's, it's really scary. There's just no good evidence that immunizations do anything. Other problems, rise of insulin-dependent diabetes from immunizations, Alzheimer's disease. Long-term creases in allergies, autism, dyslexia, learning disabilities, uh, sociopathy, um, all these things are um, clearly a side effect of immunizations. The sensitization of our immune system weakens our ability to fight off other infections. We're becoming immunological cripples, and that's one of the reasons why we're becoming predisposed to chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, environmental sensitivity syndrome. And this is becoming more and more common. And this is probably one of the biggest areas that homeopathy can really help, really help. Um, there's serious problems uh, in animals related to the mandatory rabies immunizations, um, violence, rage. I mean, there's just guidelines, you know, state and local guidelines where, you know, we have a dog on our premise and you have to get the rabies. Otherwise, you'll be arrested. But fortunately for my goats and cattle and our pigs and everything like that, I'm using more natural means, homeopathic means. I'm not uh, using um, anti-parasites, uh, chemical dewormers. I'm trying to keep my animals as healthy as I can. And I mean, so far they are very healthy. They're eating a good organic, trying to keep them in a stress-free environment. Uh, and the other problem is the mandatory immunizations in uh, you know cattle, uh, chickens, etc. We're seeing. Um, you know, the food source contaminated, you know, with all these poisons in the animals. So treating um, immunization reactions. Uh, some homeopaths will use the vaccinosis rubric and administer a remedy like silica or thuya routinely. Um, so, uh, in other words, uh, if uh, a child gets the basic set of immunizations and develops a fever or a reaction, then you would either consider silica or thuya just routinely. You know, just give them the thuya or silica. Sometimes it's given in a high dose, like 1M. There are isopathic uh, preparations um, in a homeopathic potency, like homeopathic DPT or homeopathic MMR. They've been prepared, which can be given. Uh, constitutional remedy, and that's especially effective for long-term consequences of vaccinosis. So 
there's three ways of, of doing it. Uh, I am not familiar with the isopathic. I have not used homeopathic DPT or MMR, but I am more familiar with the acute prescribing the silica or thuya or using a uh, constitutional remedy. My favorite way, because I'm not exposed to that much children, is to use the um, uh, constitutional remedy. So the immunization decision, consider each immunization separately, disease incidence and severity, vaccine side effects, access to alternative care, pressures to vaccinate from loved ones, schools. You can request an immunization exemption form, uh, delay immunizations in two years old when they're much stronger, investigate DPT, Dissatisfied Parents Together. I like that organization. And delay the immunizations until after two because the brain is a little bit more developed. So maybe wait for the immunizations until that age instead of getting, getting them at, you know, three to six months year, uh, uh, years of age. Um Okay, questions or comments regarding immunizations? Anybody have any questions or comments? I'm just curious if any of you, um, how have, have you been faced with that decision? I know that a lot of people, I'm no longer associated with a hospital, but right now, there is uh, a strong movement underway to make it mandatory uh, for people working in hospitals to get immunizations. Uh, otherwise, you're fired. Hospitals are making, you know, statements that we're uh, a hundred percent immunized uh, zone. Everybody has, you know, so it's it's a tough decision. I haven't had any immunizations in the last 20 years or so, um, you know, before I found out about all this stuff. And I think a lot of my sinus problems and um, my asthma that I developed was directly related to immunizations that I received as a kid. Thank God homeopathy has helped um, uh, strengthen, strengthen me. Okay, um, let's see. No questions? Okay, if there's no questions, let's move on to the first case. And let me okay this is a 14 uh, year old girl with severe dysmenorrhea it's mostly left-sided and crampy in nature she's unable to attend school for several days prior to her period so most of the problem seems to come on before um, she experiences simultaneous nausea and vomiting, coupled with profuse perspiration and great chilliness. There's often diarrhea associated. So um, this case here, there are some concomitants. By a concomitant is associated symptoms that occur with the dysmenorrhea. So, you know, the diarrhea isn't really connected to the uterus. So it's not like it's a certain type of bleeding and the profuse perspiration and chilliness are key symptoms. Symptoms are worse in the morning. She has problems with icy cold hands that turn blue, craving for sweet salt and fruit and uh, palpitations in the chest. So we can go through 
Um, these are the symptoms right here. Female pain, uterus, menses during, uh, vomiting, diarrhea during, perspiration, perfuse. This chilliness, this is a chick tricky one um, because, and this always frustrates me, you know, why isn't there a rubric, generalities, chilly? Well, and there isn't. Heat, vital lack of. So let's look in that section. Generalities. Heat, vital lack of. And uh, one thing I learned at the homeopathic meeting in Chicago is that body temperatures are very, very critical to understand um, because if someone is chilly, that rules out a whole group of remedies versus if somebody's warm. So sometimes that's tough to assess in a patient. You ask them, are you warm or cold-blooded? They go, I'm normal. My temperature is 97.8. Uh, it's, it's always better to try to find out what temperatures you prefer or what temperatures bother you, you know, and ask them, do you find yourself putting a sweater on or taking a sweater off before people around you? Uh, you know, do you like certain temperatures? So, you know, if they tell you that I love sunbathing, I love the sunny weather, uh, but their body temperature is normal, you can probably assume that because they like the sun and the warm weather, they tend to be chilly and they prefer the hot weather. Uh, but if they tell you, I hate the sun, I hate the warm weather, but my body temperature is normal, then they're probably on the warm side. If they tell you they like the windows open, they like circulating air, um, you know, so sometimes it's necessary to kind of go about finding out their temperature in a more roundabout way than asking them, are you hot or cold? Do you prefer warm or cold? So this is an important uh, rubric, generalities, heat, vital, lack of. Translates to be chilly. Time of aggravation is also important for remedies. There's certain things in the generalities and I believe it was uh, maybe the first or second lesson, we talked about the hierarchy of collecting symptoms. The mentals are number one. The generalities are number two. How your general body is, the general likes and dislikes, the general peculiarities are more important than specifics. So the generalities morning aggravates is more important than the stomach desire salty things or more important than extremities, coldness of the hands, icy. So the generalities, heat, vital lack of, these two generalities are very key and uh, the perspiration uh, is profuse is also key. So you have the answer. Uh, Veratrum album. Um, this is a uh, remedy that is, uh, I don't think we covered it that thoroughly, but it's a remedy for uh, also for colds and flus. Um, characteristics are very profuse perspiration, cold, chilly. In fact, um, it is um, um, a, a, a good remedy for rain odds where you get the icy cold in the hand. Cold perspiration. I treated a patient with, uh, with Veratrum album and it was the most bizarre thing in the world. Uh, they were po uh, perspiring profusely uh, in the office. This gentleman was perspiring profusely in the office and it looked as though he was really hot. And when I felt his forehead and his sweat, 
it was icy cold, icy cold. And this is characteristic of Viratra. The other character, characteristic is they, they crave uh, fruits, in particular uh, green fruit. They don't like ripe fruit, it's green fruit. So Viratrum 30C was given for this woman, and it was a steadily improved. And by the third menses, completely normal. And this is just one 30C dose, so it's not like 30C had to be given every month or every week. One 30C dose. So thing to take away in something that has a certain periodicity or frequency like a menstrual period that comes every month, or if you have a headache or something like that, don't feel that you have to give it more frequently. This was just given once. The second period uh, was not completely normal, but the third period was completely normal. So it took kind of like three cycles. Okay. So this was a good case of Veratrum album. So any questions uh, on this? Okay, this is case uh, number 11. Let's go to case number 11. This is a 19-year-old female who was in good health and she, until she developed a rapid onset of acute influenza uh, three days ago. So 19 years old, good health, rapid onset of influenza. So um, when you're taking a case or studying a case, there are certain things, rapid onset, influenza. Symptoms consisted of weakness, three is marked, mental dullness and feeling of confusion, and soreness of the whole body. She complained that the bed felt too hard. Now, that is something uh, unusual. Uh, one thing that I learned over the... Uh, at the American Institute of Homeopathic meeting is that when you're taking a case like this, uh, you really want to focus on the most peculiar symptoms. <laughs> so it's like everybody that gets the flu has weakness. I mean, I don't know of one person who gets the flu that's not weak. Of course, it's a three. You can say, oh, it's really pronounced, but and then mental dullness, that's common. Confusion, soreness, these are common. These are common, but hey, what's up with complaints that the bed felt too hard? Um, you know, unless she was sleeping on a piece of plywood, uh, you know, that's something unusual. It's almost like a delusion that the bed's too hard. She could not get comfortable and was having diarrhea. Well, when you have the flu and cold, being uncomfortable is not that common. Putrid odor in the stool, bad breath. That's kind of, you know, typically you don't see that with the flu. Craving for lemonade and for warm water. Cough worse lying down at night, sore throat, worse on swallowing. Busy active dreams, her temperature in the office was 101. Dusky red color to her face, no cervical adenopathy, so no swelling. Her throat looked mildly injected and her lungs were clear. Okay. So these are the um, uh, rubrics. Mind uh, confusion. Uh, mind dullness, generalities, influenza, that's not in Kent's repertory, that's what in one of the more uh, modern repertories, moth odor offensive. But let's look at this rubric here, generalities, um, hard bed, sensation of. Um, 
So hard, bad sensation of, and there's a whole bunch of remedies in there, which I'm kind of surprised. Um, I would think that that would be a few. Arnica, arsenic and baptisia, burrito carb, um, silica, arnica and silica are big there. So there's a lot of remedies. Um, all right. So anyway, let's, um, let me just throw a question out there to everybody. Uh, those of you that, um, did study the remedy and come up with the right remedy. I'm just curious to see how you came up with it. So Miss Debbie, you're the one that hollered Baptisia. How did you come up with uh, Baptisia and not another remedy? Well, I don't come, I don't come up with anything fast. It takes me a long time to go through every one of these little pages going back and forth. But to me, the, the hard bed was a big, a big factor for me. Um, and mind dullness, those, those were the two things that came to me. And it was, um, confusion with dullness of mind and influenza. Those were the three big factors for me, but I had to go back and forth a bunch of times before I could come up with that. Yeah. Cause let's look at mind uh, dullness. Cause that's a big, um, a big rubric. Mind dullness. Let's see what page you're so fast. You get to the pages twice. as 37. Fast as well, you know why? I'm used to turning the book. I've studied the book. I know the pages. So when if I ever see you, Debbie, and I look at your copies of your copy of Kent and it looks brand new, I know you're not oh, turning the pages. No, I know. I'm flipping the pages, but I'm still you you get there twice as fast as I do, even though I'm page flipping around. Right Is it page I'm there. 37? Dullness. Sluggishness, difficulty thinking. So, I mean, this wasn't an easy case, and that's one criticism I have with the, um, with the school, you know, because these, these are, this is not my lecture, this is actually the college. So, um, now, sleep, dreams, busy. So, let's look that up. So I'm just curious how you even came to Baptisia. Because sleep stream busy, Baptisia, Baptisia isn't there. Baronia is there. Baptisia is not there. Uh, stool odor putrid. Uh, I don't know if that could be considered something unusual. Okay, old odor, stole odor, putrid. Yeah, Baptiste is strong there, but see, most of these rubrics are, um, Are you putting that into the computer to see what how many hits come up on it? Or are you just uh, no, doing I'm that? Not, I'm not using the computer. I'm just trying to do it okay. your way. All right. I thought you were putting them in there like you did before. Okay. No. Um, but the thing is, um, you know, if you know your Materia Medica, one of the keys with Baptisia, and if you look in um, Boraki, And this is something that, you know, when I read the case, I knew it was Baptisia. Yeah, drunken came to mind, too, when I was reading in there. For um, Baptisia. Great, confu great confusion and dullness of mind. And it's a really big remedy. All the secretions are offensive. So if you look at um, 
I'm on page 83 in Boricky. Okay. Might want to turn in 83. Uh, septic conditions of the blood. Putrid phenomena always are present. Putrid. Secretions are offensive. So there's two themes in this remedy. Two, the, the way I jump to it is, number one, moth odor is offensive and stool is putrid. In other words, it's coming from both ends. And if you look at the fourth line in Boricky, all the secretions are offensive. Breath, stool, urine, and sweat. Yeah, for us, Doctor, it's page 104. For the Borakey, our pages don't line up with yours. You have a pocket manual, Homeopathic Materia Medica? Yes. This is the one. Uh... Pocket manual, Homeopathic Materia Medica, repertory by uh, you have ninth. You have ninth edition? I got the one from the school. No, in addition, it, it would be in the first page. Pocket manual should have ninth edition. This is the one that the school sent us. I'm opening up the first page. Pocket manual. Where does it say the edition? It would be the first page. I'm on the first page. The pocket manual comprising characteristic and guiding symptoms by Boricky. Yeah, it says all of that. Doesn't have the, the edition. Publisher. It says it says certified in two thousand. Okay. Anyway, I have the ninth edition. I don't know why the pages. Oh are... yes. Oh yes. On the third page, it says ninth ninth edition. This is the one that the school sent us. But every time you give me a page, I'm looking at page eighty three at the bottom. It has baptisia. No, mine is one. Oh, three. Hmm. Does everybody Which else? Be... Does everybody else have one oh three? That's why when you keep referring to this book, it's off for me. Okay. Well, anyway, it's the first. Um... It's page one oh three, okay, and then Sue, it continues on one oh four. Yeah, Sue tells me that uh, hers is just like, yeah, you know, ninth edition. That's funny. I have the ninth edition, uh, Boricky's pocket manual, and I'm on page eighty three. But anyway. Baptisia. Uh, read Baptisia for me, whatever page it's on. The symptom of the drugs are antiseptic type, stimulating low fees, or septic conditions of the blood, malarial uh, poisoning, um, great mucus, soreness, putrid, uh, uh, phenomena always present, um, offensive secretions, breath, stool, urine, sweat, etc., epidemic influenza, chronic intestinal, Proximity of children with betrid stools and, and eradications. And then it goes on to talk about mind, head, mm. face, mouth, throat, and stomach. And read the mind. Read the mind section. The mind. Wild, wondering, feeling, unable to think, mental confusion, ideas confused, illusion of divided personality, thinks he is broken or double, and tosses about the bed trying to get pieces together. Delirium, wondering, muttering, perf perfect, perfect indifference, falls asleep while being spoken to, mm, melaconic, I don't know what that word, with stupor. Okay. Well, anyway, there was three characteristics to this case. It's the marked confusion and dullness and the odors from both ends, offensive and the hard the mouth. And the hard bed. So those three things immediately um, led me, you know, to uh, Baptisia. It's a big influenza remedy. And, um, you know, so that's essentially when you're doing a case, part of it, part of the knowledge is you need to know, you know, a little bit of Materia Medica. And of course, the best way to study Materia Medica is like we're doing right now. So, you know, hopefully in your mind now, if you see another case like this with a lot of confusion, influenza, a horrible moth odor and putrid stool, 
And, you know, even if the, there's not a hard sensation of the bed, it's, you know, a good case for Baptisia. Good case for Baptisia. So let's look here. Um, and this was an amazing case. It's a very big flu remedy. Busy active dreams. Bed is too hard. Putrid or offensive quality to the odors, diarrhea, soreness all over the body. Sore throat, which is aggravated sol swallowing, aggravated solids, ameliorated liquids. Pyrogenium, which is a homeopathic remedy made from pus, also can cover some of these symptoms. But one dose of Baptisia 30C was given and the case resolved in 12 hours completely. 12 hours completely. That's impressive. So that, one, that was just one remedy. So even though this person was so sick, it wasn't like the 30C had to be given every hour, every half hour. But the thing is, you give the 30C and, um, you know, you expect a, a positive change. Oh, Sue made the comment. She found Baptisia in one of our slides about the hardness of the bed. So I already told you that before. I know it's yes, a lot we, of a lot yes, of stuff. Yes, no, we heard that because it's very unique. Hardness of the bed. So anyway, um, I'm just curious. Have any of you um, treated any cases of flu? I'm going to mute you, mute you, Debbie, because I can hear you cracking your paper. Okay. Anybody out there, have you treated any cases of flu? Either yourself or family members? Okay. Debbie, you did uh, some Belladonna. Let me open you up here. Okay, tell us about your Belladonna case. Yes, um, um, of course. There's always a husband and a wife in the in the house, typically, or or children bring something home. So uh, for one of my clients, the husband came home sick, had all the symptoms. Uh, she pushed him to the room. You're you're now exiled from the rest of the house because I'm working. I can't get sick, and he had all the symptoms of the sore throat and fever and all that stuff. And it was a quick onset. And she said to him, I can't get sick. I have no time. So she, I had her take Belladonna one time. Her throat was beginning to feel funny. The head was beginning to feel funny. One time it was gone. Wow. So it happened pretty quickly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. And that was easy. I didn't even have to think about that one. You know, some of them require me. I have to look up for 30 minutes before I can make a decision what to recommend. Uh -huh. Well, you know, remember you're a student. And, you know, homeopathy, um, you know, you learn from your cases. The more you use homeopathy, the more comfortable uh, you'll become. But a uh, good case. Anybody else have any, treat anybody with the flu? Anybody try and not succeed? Because I think that would be good if uh, we talk about maybe a case that you tried and you didn't have any luck. Okay, Sue. Um, Sue, did you raise your hand? Well, yes, I've only tried it uh, once. Not that I wouldn't try it more, but I think my own kids aren't as, you know, mm -hmm. ready for, I mean, ready to do it. My husband is way more willing, but I did try it on my grandson way back after we had like our first or second one. I think maybe our second one, I used that heifer sulf. So, mm -hmm. uh, so or something, which probably now I, that I know more, wasn't probably the best, but it worked. I mean, he was coughing and he was real irritated. And I remember from what our class was, I tried that and one dose and he was better. So, I mean, I guess it did work, but you know, I'm sure there's probably better ones now that I know so much more about <laughs> other things. <laughs> yeah. Well, some, sometimes in homeopathy, um, 
you know, it doesn't have to be the exact remedy. It's just something that's close that covers the symptoms. So I want all of you out there not to feel like, ah, got to be the exact remedy or I'm going to hurt the person. It's, you're not, yeah. if it's the wrong remedy, you're not going to get any action. But how soon did you have an effect? Oh, it was like within an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was real quickly. He was coughing and he had been real irritable and he's only 18 months and, he, you know, so he's like six, you know, 15 months at the time. And, um, it's, you know, it was the one that I read through my slot, you know, my homework. I mean, that's how I figured it out. I mean, I looked it up in the book, but I was doing it off my slides and then looked up that one. But it did work. I mean, it was like maybe a couple hours. But I, uh -huh. I remember that he was, um, for a couple of days, he had had this cough and he was just real irritable and acted like his throat hurt and, you know, stuff like that. And it just, um, I can't remember exactly. I mean, it's been a few months ago that I did. But that. the irritability, the sore throat, you know, all those things point to. Um, soft, I so. do have a question. Um, with the belladonna, you, you, is that safe enough? Like on the young kids? I mean, would you go ahead and do that? He had a high fever a couple weeks ago. And, you know, I also have essential oils and I use peppermint oil and clove oil, which on his feet, which brought it down. But I was, you know, we were concerned because he went up to like 104 and I knew that would work, but I, I didn't have time to go do my study. And I, of course, belladonna came to mind, but, um, I was just, Oh wondering. no, by all means, um, you'd, you'd be amazed at how quick and effective homeopathic remedies like belladonna are for a high fever. Okay. You know, especially if it comes in the middle of the night, like 3 AM, that's characteristic of belladonna, the high mm -hmm. fever, the redness, the irritability, you know, a couple of pellets on the mm -hmm. tongue. This so, was in the evening, early evening. I think that was one thing, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I was just afraid not. Well, we were trying to get to it quickly, uh -huh. you know, and everything. So I was a little nervous about using it, but. That, no, Belladonna. But now, Belladonna is uh, just a great remedy. <laughs> and you'll be surprised at how well it works. And it's extremely safe because remember, you don't get the aggravations like you do for constitutional. So don't be concerned that you give a belladonna, you're going to cause the fever to go up. Yes. And of course, you know, the fever thing, we all know, or we all probably know that we're supposed to let it run. It's just when it starts, it was getting to closer to 105. And, you know, uh -huh. there's a point there you're like, where is it safe and where is it not? I called our chiropractor and he said, don't let it go over 105. And, um, you know, so he says, as long as it drops quickly like that, then don't be concerned. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That kind of scary with a little kid like that. Oh, <laughs> you know, he's just. Mm -hmm. Well, it's better so, than going to the hospital and getting. Um, everything they, they everything have there. Yeah. And give, and, cause, you know, <laughs> but just remember, homeopathy doesn't cause a suppression. It's helping the body do what it's trying to do. So that's true. That's uh, a good way to think about that. So you're assisting the body. You're not suppressing the fever, like giving him aspirin or a acetaminophen or something like that, or mm -hmm. ice, ice baths. And, uh, you know, you're assisting the body. So if it's the right remedy, the fever will drop so quickly. You'll be, you'll be amazed. And if it's okay. the wrong remedy, nothing's going to happen. Then you think of, you know, aconite or, you know, some of the other flu remedies. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else uh, attempt treating the flu? Because even if sometimes you learn more when it doesn't work. Hey, Norm, you have a something to share? <laughs> Let's see, Norm, are you there? Norm, I guess you can't hear me. Your hand's up. Norm? Okay, I guess uh, nothing from Norm. Okay, anybody else? <laughs> well, I mentioned my two 
treating myself with gelsemine that worked really well and baronia for my wife, uh, which worked really well. I think it just it saved both of us. And even though this flu is supposed to be really nasty and, you know, my symptoms resolved in just a couple of, couple of days, probably less than, less than maybe a little bit over a day. I was still weak, but I was back to functioning. Didn't need anything. Okay. Case number eight. I'm going to, let's go back here. Let's go over some materia medica. Um, so a man developed traveler's diarrhea in Mexico, had this for several weeks, tried flagell without success. Uh, diarrhea is acrid and offensive, um, constant, felt exhausted, very chilly, mucus in the stool with occasional blood. Hemorrhoids developed, ameliorated heat, uh, not hungry, but strong craving for sour things, especially lemon, stomach pain and diarrhea, aggravated between 12 and 2 a.m. So these time modalities are, if they're there, uh, they're really important. Um, Thirst modalities, thirsty and craving warm drinks, and body temperature. Extremities were cold and he developed a shanker sore of the mouth, which was burning. So other things that make a case, uh, I guess, easier to comprehend is these concomitants, uh, because you know, the shanker sores of the moth really don't have anything to do uh, with the diarrhea. I mean, he, he got the hemorrhoids, but the shanker sores, so that's kind of peculiar. Felt better with warmth, but couldn't work because he felt so prostate. Restless, difficulty sitting still, anxious, and feeling desperate. So if you're going to be doing a hierarchy, of symptoms, um, you know, the mental and emotional are something that you really have to look at. That's probably the highest hierarchy. So this restlessness, difficulty sitting still, which kind of confirms the restlessness. One is the actual feeling of being restless versus not being able to sit still. And you would think uh, with his traveler's diarrhea and being exhausted, that's kind of unusual, being exhausted and not being able to sit still and restless. Anxiety and feeling desperate. These are two uh, also mental symptoms that we have to factor into the case. So that has a high hierarchy. And then um, uh, I like to look at the body temperature, extremities cold. The shanker sores of the moth, which would be high up there as a symptom. And um, uh, the time, aggravated 12 to 2 a.m. So these are the uh, symptoms in the repertory. So um, let's see. Stomach desires lemon, hemorrhoids, warmth, stool, mucus, stool, acrid. So the remedy is arsenicum album. Now, those of you that did the case, um, I'd be curious again. Let's see where... Uh, curious again as to how um, uh, you came up with the remedy. So, you know, going through this, I really didn't put it in the in the computer. But if anybody has 
some comments if you came up with the remedy how you how you got the remedy because there's a lot of features here um you know for our cynicum album that uh kind of, almost kind of give give the case away so let me since nobody's hands going up let me talk about it um, arsenicum has a couple of unique symptoms and that always go throughout the case. The one thing with arsenicum is the burning. Um, and of course, in this case, you had two uh, features of that, the burning uh, ulcers, aphthous ulcers in the moth and the acrid stools, the burning stools. Um, so that is a characteristic of arsenicum. Uh, the other feature of arsenicum is the classic aggravation after midnight, 12 to 2 a.m. Any type of aggravation after midnight, you think of arsenicum. Uh, also arsenicum almost universally has a tendency towards chilliness and restlessness. Uh, they're an anxious remedy. They can be very desperate. They worry about, worry about uh, um, a lot of fears and anxiety. So even though uh, they're chilly, um, let's go back. Um, they also tend to be thirsty and crave warm drinks, um, especially during their illness, arsenicum. And they also have this business of um, craving lemons. What other remedy out there uh, has this feature with lemons? Lemonade. There's another remedy that we studied. If anybody, does anybody remember? You can write it down on your question. There's another remedy, uh, typically a flu remedy that um, craves lemonade. Does anybody know? Uh, one of you prescribed the remedy successfully. Uh coming to mind okay the remedy is belladonna belladonna characteristically craves uh, lemonade or, or sour drinks sour drinks so anyway getting back to this arsenicum album case burning is a characteristic feature anytime you hear burning pain Think of our cynicum album. In this case, there were two areas of burning, the acrid burning stools and the burning uh, moth ulcers. Um, the chili remedy, characteristic feature, 12 to 2 a.m. aggravation is classic for our cynicum and the anxiety. So clearly a very, very clear case of our cynicum album. Um, you know, most of the, um, uh, remedies or most of the, um, uh, symptoms pointed to arsenicum album, uh, and, but once again, it may have been difficult to, to come up with this remedy, uh, simply because if you don't know the, um, um, you know, the, the characteristic features of our Cynicum album, you may miss it. So let's look in Boricky, our Cynicum album. Of course, my page is going to be different than yours. Um, our Cynicum album. Here we are. It's my page 63. 
and I'm reading the second paragraph. Exhaustion, restlessness with nightly uh, aggravation, unquenchable thirst, um, fear, fright, or worry, mind, great anguish and restlessness, changes place continually. So there was a symptom of being exhausted, restlessness, not being able to sit sit still. And um, this key aggravation aggravated after midnight. Now, in this particular case, um, three pages, or not three pages, three doses of arsenic amalgam were given, resolved in 24 hours, uh, no uh, recurrence. Sometimes um, when you're treating something like um, uh, chronic, you know, diarrhea, is that I would recommend giving a dose after every bowel movement. So, and I think that's the way this was prescribed. This was an actual case at the uh, American Medical College of Homeopathy in Phoenix. And of course, Phoenix is close to Mexico. So we see a lot of cases of Montezuma's re revenge or food poisoning. In fact, I personally vouch for myself being treated with arsenicum album coming back from Mexico. Um, so anyway, one way, I think the reason why three doses were given, sometimes you give a dose after each bowel movement. So if I recall, this patient felt a little bit better after the first dose, but every uh, bowel movement, um, he was given a dose of arsenicum album 30C. And the symptoms resolved in 24 hours, no recurrence. And once again, this is another case that was treated with um, just a 30C potency. Okay, any questions? Uh, any questions on, on this case? Um, I don't know, Sue, did you, have a, did you have a question? Your hand's up. I don't know if you left your hand up from the previous time. Question? Oh, I just by mistake left that. Okay. No, I'm fine. Thanks. Just stretching. Sue was just stretching. That's why her hand was up. Okay, another um, another case. This is a 33 year old with a symptom of vaginitis. Has had for three days. Profuse leucorrhea or white discharge, which is milky in color and thick. Itching present, which is voluptuous. Symptoms worse after exertion. Uh, symptoms started shortly before the period. Uh, perspiration on the occiput at night. So, um, There is really no mental symptoms in this case. Uh, the strongest physical symptom is the leucorrhea um, with itching and, and, and marked itching. And the symptoms are worse after exertion. And they started shortly before the period. So uh, in terms of symptoms, this time modality is, is, is important. The symptoms started shortly before the period. And the other peculiar symptom, which is a concomitant, which we like, is the perspiration on the occiput at night in bed. I would like to know, did this perspiration start uh, during the uh, vaginitis? Or was this something going on, you know, uh, as a just characteristic of this person? 
So these are the symptoms, uh, female leucorrhea profuse, female leuco leucorrhea thick, uh, exertion aggravates, hid perspiration, female leucorrhea menses before, leucorrhea milky, female itching voluptuous. Now, um, I don't know if anybody got the remedy, uh, but the remedy is calcarea carbonica. When I was first doing this case, I thought of sepia. Uh, sepia is uh, a uh, really big homeopathic remedy for leucorrhea. And uh, many times um, uh, I was taught that you never prescribe sepia unless they have a history of leucorrhea. So I'm just curious out of the group if um, if anybody uh, had luck in in finding calcarea carbonica or thought of this, uh, or has anybody had any experience in treating uh, leucorrhea? Let's uh, just for fun. Let's look at. Um, This symptom here, female leucorrhea menses before. So let's look. Let's look in Kent's repertory. I'm hoping that my pages of Kent's repertory are a little bit user friendly with you. So let's look up female. Whoever comes to the page, let me know. That's genitalia, female, leucorrhea. I'm in that section, leucorrhea. Uh, page 144. <laughs> Female leucorrhea menses before. I'm on page 722. How are you guys getting? Oh, okay, Sue got 721. I'm on 722. Um, leucorrhea menses before. Mine's 722. And it's interesting, um, calcarea and sepia are both pretty strong rem remedies for menses before. Now, can somebody tell me what is the big differential? And I think this is key in this case, which, differenti di which differentiates calcarea, carbonica from sepia for this case of leucorrhea. Because everything else, I think sepia will be everywhere, but there's one, uh, actually two, actually two symptoms here um, that point to calcarea carbonica and not sepia. Any thoughts from you guys? What two rubrics here? point towards calcarea carbonica and not sepia. Anybody know? No hands are going up. As a matter of fact, we we read in um, Borky about calcarea carbonica. So I'm going to have you guys do a little exercise here. I want you to turn to Borky. And read in Borky until you come to something that points to calcarea carbonica and not to sepia. Because to me, it's a clear, unless we had these two symptoms, it would be a toss-up. Because I was quite surprised. I thought that, that there's only going to be one remedy that sepia was not going to be in menses before, but it's there in a bold type. 
So that kind of ruined my theory. All right. Debbie. Well, this is just a, can you hear me, doctor? Yep, I hear you. This is just a guess. Sometimes I do elimination by not so much how they line up, but how they don't line up. And for the sepia, it's it's aggravated from 2 to 4 p.m. or 3 uh, to 5 p.m. Okay. So time ag aggregation. Okay, but was there a time aggravation in this case? Was I was thinking it was worse at night and worse with exercise. Okay, let me see. Worse with exertion. Wait. Uh, exertion, yeah, but I don't see, there's no time, profuse leukorrhea, itching, symptoms worse after exertion. Oh, perspiration on the occiput at night. So it's not an aggravation of the leukorrhea, it's just that symptom at night. <laughs> But it's interesting. Uh, any other thoughts? It's interesting. Uh, and if you know the Materia Medica, this will clearly, you know, in your mind, if you know the basic Materia Medica of sepia and the basic Materia Medica of Calcura Carbonica, it'll be as clear as night and day. The answer is sepia characteristically is ameliorated from exertion. Uh, they tend to love exercise. They love to work out. They love to exercise. Calcarea carbonica is lazy. Remember we talked about flabby, fat, chubby. They're couch potatoes. They are worse with exercise. All calcarea carbonicas. They don't, you're not going to see a Calcarea carbonica at the gym. But a sepia, they love to work out. The other thing about calcarea carbonica, get the picture of the little cherub baby, little fat chubby baby uh, with a sweaty head. Calcarea carbonica has a lot of perspiration on their head at, at night. Characteristic calcarea carbonica, sweaty head. Little baby with a sweaty head. So these two things. Um, point directly to Calcarea Cabonica. Um, so leukorrhea in infants on or before the onset of puberty, aching in the vagina, voluptuous sensation, aggravated during the day, urinating and exercise. Um, so the big differential, because sepia is a big remedy for leukorrhea. In fact, I think it's the number one remedy. It's prescribed more frequently than calcarea carbonica. So this would be a slam dunk case for sepia if it was ameliorated by aggravation and you didn't have the um, symptoms of, um, you know, the sweating on the head. So 30C twice a day for two days and symptom resolved completely. So why did they get 30C twice a day for two days? Uh, well, uh, probably because there may have been somewhat of an amelioration and then maybe uh, the itching increased and it was repeated. Um, so you have to be cautious when you're repeating a remedy like this. But often, sometimes a remedy is repeated mainly because of the nervousness or lack of confidence of the prescriber. So it could be that maybe only 30C once would be all that was needed, you know, for this case. So it's always a tough call whether to repeat, but when in doubt, I would say it's always better to wait in homeopathy. So I hope that this, that feature is becoming clear. Let's see. Uh, Sue, did you have a question? Your hands up, or is that just stretching? Oh, no. I was um, wondering. I mean, it seemed like that the one with the um, sepia had a greenish discharge, and that the milky one was with the cow uh, 
the other one, the cow, whatever it is. Okay, I'm not that familiar with that, but that could be a subtle differentiating feature. Okay, I was, I mean, I was just reading through there while we were talking about it. And okay, that may be I another. Maybe, I was wondering if that was the reason you were saying that. I was wondering if that was the answer. So. Oh, uh, no, I think the other two things are at least clear in my mind. Okay. You know, the exertion, you know, cow, they hate exertion. Sepia loves it. That stuck out really, you know, blatant, very, very prominent. And the other thing was the, you know, calcarea, they, they, all of them have sweaty heads. They perspire at night. Okay, cool. Thanks. So that was given. And I think Debbie, was your hand up or no, it's, uh, it's back down. All right. But there may be some subtle differentiate differential in terms of the milky copious, the texture of the leucorrhea, but I'm not aware of that. And that could be another fine point in the, um, uh, Materia Medica. Okay, let's do another case. 44-year-old with acute bronchitis began two weeks ago. And um, has not improved with antibiotics or cough suppressants. Cough is worse in the cold air and better cold drinks. So that's... Um, Kind of a little peculiar. Not so unusual to have cough, cough worse than the cold air, but better cold drinks. I would think, you know, warm drinks would be better. Um, it is causing asthmatic breathing. Never had before. When she coughs, she often loses her urine, which is embarrassing. Um, so loss of urine, I think that is kind of like a concomitant. Cough is worse bending forward. And always like to put our hat on a mental and emotional. Began after she lost her dog suddenly when it was hit by a car. So, um, but you still don't know the emotion. You know, was this grief uh, or was it anger? Uh, or even fair. So you know there's some emotional component, but this person could have any one of these reactions. Uh, she could be angry at the at the driver of the car that hit her dog. She could be afraid that she might get hit by a car and die, or just grief. So I'm going to assume that the most common um, um, emotion is going to be grief, not the other two especially with the asthma symptoms, because the lungs tend to be grief. So I'm going to assume that it's somehow tied into grief because of the lung problems. And that's the reason why she's not getting better with the antibiotics. So we have that. And uh, we have the modalities, uh, worse cold air, cold drinks. So chest inflammation, bronchial tubes, aggravated cold air, ameliorated cold drinks, asthmatic, uh, urination, cough, uh, cough bending, forwarding, mind ailments from grief. And um, causticum is the remedy. And causticum is a uh, big remedy for injustice and it's probably the number one remedy of involuntary urination on coughing you know uh i know for me let's just wait let's go back here and look at bladder urination uh involuntary cough Whoever finds it, uh, let's type it up because I'm looking here. Find bladder. Urination. 
I got the bladder section. Urination involuntary. Coughing. Okay, I got it. I beat everybody. Uh, bottom of 659. Debbie, how'd you get page 181? I'm in Kent. Bottom of 659. Bladder, urination, cough, during. That maybe there's something on 181. <laughs> nope, I don't see anything on 181. Okay, so if you look at page 659 in Kent, um, you'll see bladder urination cough during and the ones in bold are apis causticum natrium muriaticum phosphorus pulsatilla and squillium uh, natrium muriaticum is a, a big remedy um, for grief so that's there strongly um, but the other characteristic of causticum Uh, that makes it unique is um, the modalities of causticum. Aggravated cold air, aggravated bending forward and mediated warm drinks. Um, and uh, causticum is very idealistic. Anger over injustice, rebellious. They also have... Um, Carpal tunnel syndrome, gout, anxiety, asthma, neuralgia. So this is a uh, uh, causticum case. And um, the way, um, once again, for kind of finding out the most important symptoms is uh, I always look for the mental. Of course, it's an assumption. We weren't able to talk to the person about their reaction and the clear-cut uh, modalities. Uh, Debbie, did you have a question? Oh, I was just putting down the page 181 was the other book where our, our book, our pages don't line up for explaining causticum. Okay, let me see causticum. It's not going to be my page. It's not going to be my page 181. That's for our um, board book for the um, pocket manual. Okay. For me, the other book that you have, we're lining up on the pages, but on, on the, the one we talked about, the ninth edition, our pages don't line up. And they have it from the beginning. It's not just this class. Okay. Yeah, mine's on page 146. Yeah. I think we have more pages added to our book, Doctor. Our seems maybe because it's maybe because they just, this is the one right that we ordered right before the class started. It seems okay. to be more pages. My, the total number of pages in my book is uh, 889. That's the number of pages. Well, but then there's pages that start over at the bit back of the book. Mm -hmm. I don't know if yours do that. But I think the, the description of the remedy is the same. I don't know why there's a difference. Well, see, our pages go to, see, we've got a bunch of additions here in the back. Our pages go to 1116 mm -hmm. in the back. And then there's a whole nother section added on the essentials of rare and uncommon remedies. I don't know if you have that. And then the pages start over. No, I don't have rare and uncommon remedies. I got the classic. I See, I think in our book, they've just added more pages than yours has. They've added mm -hmm. more. Okay. Okay. Our pages uh, I think Norm, uh, Norm, you have a question? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I just wasn't plugged in properly before. But on second page of ours, it says 56, 52nd Impression 2012. Yours is probably published a little bit earlier. Let me see. Uh, 
Yeah, this is page number two. Yeah, just after the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Preface to the first edition. Just under, it's, there's a, um, it says pocket manual of homeopathic uh, material medic and respiratory, and respiratory. And then just under that, it says 52nd impression, 2012. I just have ninth edition revised and enlarged. You don't have any dates on yours? Copyright 1927. Yeah, ours probably says that too, but I'm looking at the preface to the repertory glossary. No, I don't have that. Philadelphia, PA, June 1927. Oscar Borke wrote the intro. Preface, prefatory note to the repertory. Yeah. Well, ours was just printed this last year. Okay. Um, here I thought I had the latest edition. <laughs> But I guess I don't. I'm not having luck. Anytime I pull out a Borky, but I think the information on the remedies is the same. Because when Debbie was yes. reading, when Debbie was reading, there was it was identical. It is. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Debbie, did you have did you have another question? No. Is okay, my hand wrong? Yeah, your hand's still up. Okay, now your hand's done. All right. So anyway, Costicum is uh, has those clear modalities. Um, they're sympathetic. They have anger over injustices. Uh, they're rebellious, grief. Um, so. In this case, uh, not only was it the grief of the dog being killed, but probably just the nature of the injustice, <laughs> excuse me, of the whole situation that caused um, the persistent um, uh, pulmonary problems that weren't responsive to antibiotics. Okay, let's do another case. A uh, 45-year-old male with acute hepatitis, 10 days. Uh, jaundice, another bad experience for Mexico. We have one case with diarrhea, now we have jaundice. Um, a lot of stress, so I always like the, the mentals, as you can see. But once again, a lot of stress prior to the onset, but we don't know uh, what the stress was causing in him. Um, um, jaundice, nausea, chills, muscle aches, mild pain in the liver, confusion, lightheadedness, diminished uh, visual acuity, fatigue. So this time modality is nice to see. Um, 4 to 8 p.m. And here, when asked about the stress, he said, I'm afraid that someone will find out that I'm an imposter. I have a lot of anxiety. Now, wh when today did we talk about this idea of being an imposter? Does anybody remember? It had to do with a miasm. Imposter. Does anybody remember the miasm? That they're covering up. Um, so that may be a hint for the miasm. And it's also, this seems to be this described himself as a small person growing up. He would avoid fights at all costs. He feels like a small child inside, very timid. Uh, he would sabotage his grades in order to stand out less. Irritable over little things, fear of commitment. He has recently 
got engaged quite egotistical. Does anybody, this is describing a miasm, and it, one of three, I want somebody to take a guess. Imposter, anxiety, small person, avoiding fights, feels like a small child inside, timid, sabotaging his grades, so he wouldn't stand up. Okay, Norm, thought on the miasm? Syphilitic. Uh, well, nope. No. no syphilitic is destruction. Okay. That's a despair and hopelessness. There's nothing here about the destruction. Is there despair? He's afraid someone's going to find him out as a posture. There's a lot of anxiety, but I don't see any word of despair. He's irritable, okay. commit, you know, committed. He's not suicidal. He's hiding. He's hiding. He's an imposter. Um, and this is classic um, psychosis. So does anybody have the, um, I don't want to back up all the slides, but does anybody have the description of psychosis? Um, you know, Sora has the itch. Uh, but psychosis is all about covering up, hiding, not wanting people to know who you are. That's psychosis. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's a clear, yep. clearly psychotic case. In fact, let me um, let me go back to. Let's see. Let's go back here and see. Uh, better discharge creatures of night. Let's see. That's not it. Hahnemann's miasm. Yeah, here. Creatures of night secretive try to hide weaknesses and develop fixed habits to cover it up. Inner feelings of incapacity and weakness. That's key with the psychotic miasm. Uh, the syphilitic miasm, obsessive compulsive, um, congenital deformities, depression, despair, hopelessness. See, a lot of times it has to do with um, extremes. Um, let me just say, for example, let's see, we're here. He, he felt that he was an imposter, a lot of anxiety, small person growing up, feels like a small child inside, very timid, uh, fear of commitment. Um, so, you know, these symptoms could be taken to an extreme. Um, and if it was taken to the, the extreme, it would be you know, more of a syphilitic miasm. So, you know, like maybe if he refused to even go to school, you know, he became like a paranoid. Um, um, so the syphilitic is more of an extreme. This is, this is hiding, you know, trying to cover up, which is classic um, psychoses. 
And the reason why um, the miasm in this case is so important is because this particular remedy is a big uh, psychotic remedy. This idea of uh, sabotaging his grades in order to stand out less. Um, you know, fear of commitment. You know, when you commit to some somebody in a relationship, you know, they may find out who you are. It's much better off to have many superficial relationships and not let them, you know, know. Uh, and these people, often when you first meet them, they, they appear to be very egotistical because they're trying to put you down. They're trying to make you feel little, you know. Some of the most timid and insecure people are in positions of, um, of uh, making you look um, weaker. Okay, so anyway, these are the uh, rubrics. And of course, you know the remedy, uh, but this is a big remedy for inflammation of the liver egotism, mind, timidity. And classically, it has an aggravation 4 to 8 p.m. And um, like a podium. So this fear of commitment is what triggered him in getting sick. Um, feeling of being an imposter, being small and timid, and cowardice as a child. So the actual etiology, he recently got engaged. Read this recently getting engaged is what triggered his hepatitis. So let's look up in um, Kent's repertory, generalities, um, afternoon, four to eight. So generalities, afternoon, anybody find a page? I, it's on page 1342. Uh, 1342. And you can see it's a fairly small rubric and lycopodium is there. Lycopodium is a big uh, liver remedy. Uh, this egotism. And it's also a big, big psychotic remedy. Psychotic they want to cover up. They're hiding something. Syphilitic remedy does not cover up. They don't really give a damn what they're doing. These are suicidal people. They're depressed people. They're despondent people. They're homicidal. They do it. They're not, they're, they're, they're really, you know, functioning in that, in that pathology. So let's look up lycopodium. Okay. So if you look at the mind, melancholy, afraid to be alone, extremely sensitive, adverse to undertaking new things, loss of self-confidence, fear of breaking down under stress, weak memory, cannot bear to see anything new. Another characteristic of lycopodium, these people are deathly afraid of public speaking, but they can be the greatest public speakers. Deathly afraid of public speaking because people are going to find out who they are or they're going to make a mistake. So what they do is if they, if they have to speak publicly, they practice, they practice, they practice over and over again until they become 
a great delivery. But they have this fear. Okay, so symptoms of hepatitis are common. Fear of commitment is the key in this case. Uh, the time modality, fear of being an imposter. Um, 200 C was given single dose. Uh, and probably the 200 C was given mainly because of uh, this was probably a deep pathology. It was very mental and emotional and very strongly, um, very strongly a um, uh, psychotic case. This is an upper respiratory infection for five days. Symptoms are nondescript, nasal discharge, mild aggravated um, late in the morning. Three cold sores on the lips, centering at the right corner of the mouth. Five chancre sores that are quite painful, dark circles under the eye. So here, looking through this, um, you don't really have any mental, emotional, uh, cold sores. Uh, the chancre sores are very prominent. So uh, the eyes are watering. Uh, the nasal discharge is profuse. So characteristic nasal discharge profuse with constant dripping. Um, upper respiratory infection. So you know, the, the, the relationship between the upper respiratory infection, the nasal, the cold sores, dark circles under the eyes, the eyes water every time they cough, which is sounds like a um, very peculiar symptom, which may lead us to the, the remedy. So these are the symptoms here. And, um, Natrium muriaticum is a very, very big remedy for cold sores, shankers, asthma. Uh, the characteristic is um, uh, the watery uh, nasal discharges. So every symptom here, perfuse, face eruption, herpes of the list, right side, loose circles, every symptom here is a characteristic of um, natrium muriaticum, um, but there's no evidence of any um, sadness in this case. So typically in the nature of muriaticum, um, uh, there's ailments uh, from grief, uh, sadness, a breaking up of a relationship, uh, that, that thing. Um, uh, also, they are, they're worse at 10 a.m. So nature of muriaticum, uh, is uh, the perfect remedy for this. The last one, um, conjunctivitis. 10 days and no improvement. Itching, redness. Itching is worse at night. Cracking at the corners of the eyes. Burning pains. And sand and photophobia. So there's just a lot of eye symptoms. Once again, I always like to look at the mental and emotional there's uh, really nothing here. Um, itching and redness, eyes sticking together, cracking, burning pains, which are at night. So this is something aggravated at night. Burning pains at night. Remember when we were studying the miasms, this is a characteristic feature of a syphilitic. All syphilitic remedies are worse at night, burning. There's also destruction, cracking in the corners of the eyes, which could be kind of an ulceration. So these are the symptoms here. And sulfur is the remedy. Um, sulfur isn't really considered a syphilitic remedy. It's um, more of a trimiasmatic although it's considered more soric by many homeopathic pathic doctors. Prolonged infection, which is not resolving. This is typical of sulfur. Redness, burning, and cracking, all worse at night. Typical time aggravation. 
and sulfur's egotistical, lazy, weekend headaches, and uh, something burning, hot, messy, intellectual, and critical. Sulfur is a really big um, skin remedy, very big skin remedy, um, which has this, has all of those features. Okay, any um, any questions? Uh, I really appreciate your attention. I think that we covered a lot of good material, and I hope that you're beginning to get a better understanding of homeopathy. Don't be afraid to turn the pages on, on the Kent's repertory, and don't be afraid to read about each remedy. Every time you do this, you'll gain a little bit more knowledge, and, and I would go through the cases uh, that we uh, went went here, the Materia Medica, to help help in your understanding, and you know, go into the repertory, and um, you know, find the rubrics that are key for these cases. And everything uh, we're going to be, um, I'll send you the link. I'll send you. We got one more class, uh, so let's make it a good one. And um, I'll send you your homework assignment. So if there's no other questions, um, any other questions? Checking here. Okay, I think Debbie, Debbie has a question. Debbie, question? I was just I was just thinking, and this was a month ago, and I'm sorry I've had a very very hectic past month. But that the case that you sent us that was like three pages long was that the number eight that we did earlier that, that had you had given us so much information on that case. Yeah, I didn't want to really go over that because um, I don't know why the American Medical College put that case in there. It's more of a constitutional case. It was for extra credit. If anybody did it, and you want to send me the results, we can talk about it. But I didn't want to take up class time going over that. Can you just tell me the answer so I could study it? Oh, no, I don't want to tell you the answer. If you just, that's working backwards. If you come up with some ideas, no. then I'll. No, I, I sent in the answer to you uh, like three weeks ago. Okay, well, why, I don't said, we, I'm not. why don't we set up a 30-minute time period? Because everybody, yeah, please schedule your 30-minute time period so we can discuss some areas that you're stuck or some things and we can talk about that case. Okay. All right. Okay. That one was so long. That one was so long. It was overwhelming. Yeah, it's overwhelming. And I don't think it was really appropriate to put it in, you know, the class. Um, but, uh, you know, the American Medical College of Homeopathy, they have a lot of students that are want to go into constitutional prescribing. And those of you that do want to learn constitutional prescribing or a deeper way of doing constitutional work, we can talk about that at the next class. I mean, what the next step will be for you if you're interested in, um, you know, learning, uh, uh, you know, deeper a deeper level of homeopathy. Okay. But that would be through the school and not through you, correct? Oh, no, it could be through me or there's other classes that are given, you know, throughout the United States. So uh, the school is one one way of doing it or doing it through me. I'm thinking about maybe setting up, um, you know, uh, a program where we meet at the wellness center a couple times a year for a long weekend. We actually do live cases. We go over remedies and we go into all this stuff deeper. But the next level is where you actually have to be, you know, in a classroom. Uh, you have to like do some actual case taking or see a case being taken and the analysis and discussion and things like that. And then follow up. So those same, pe same people will come back, you know, with a follow up. So you, you learn how, how they're doing, how they respond to the remedy. But my question is, doctor, when we do it through you, when we're done at some point, do you get some sort of certificate that says you've done the work, you've done the course? I called the school, and they said it was like a three-year course, and you would have to go out to Arizona three times during three years. The rest would all be done on the computer, if I understood mm -hmm. it correctly. Yeah, that's their that's their course.
But the bottom line is your certificate is taking the national examination, the Council of Homeopathic Certification and National Exam. You need so many credit hours of education. You have to submit so many cases. Uh, and then you take a written and an oral exam. So as we do these classes with you, do we get credit for that? If we decide to go longer and, and yeah, learn? You would, you would get credit. But at this point, I'm not sure if I'm going to do this because I have a wonderful facility here. It's perfect for, you know, students to come and I enjoy teaching homeopathy. Um, so we would, you know, if you are interested, let me know and we would talk about it. But the important factor for me is that when we're done at whatever point, even if it's three years, we could say we've, we took the course. Yes. We learned. Oh enough yeah. It's credit hours. Um, uh, okay. My goal would be to, so you have enough knowledge to pass the test. Um, so it's one thing gaining homeopathic knowledge, but we would have to do some work with, you know, the organ on philosophy, more materia medica, because when you take the examination, you know, you have to know the repertory, you got to know the materia medica, um, you know, you got to have a, a good foundation. Plus you have to have a certain number of credit hours of teaching. So because I'm on the faculty at the American Medical College of Homeopathy, I'm certified to give, you know, uh, credit hours of education. Just like this course, you're going to get, um, I think, 35 hours of credit for this course, which goes towards, I believe it's 500 credit hours of, for the Council of Homeopathy. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah, it goes towards the 500 credit hours. You will get a certificate, um, you know, uh, a final exam. I'll probably have to send you a final exam for this, you know, to get the certificate, but you do get the Yeah, credit. because the clients are, the clients are still going to see when you're done and you've been studying that you do have your diploma up on the wall, which gives you more credentials, I believe. Right. And that credential would be the console of homeopathic certification. That would be kind of the gold standard for any practicing homeopath. And when I refer someone, if someone asks me, is there a good homeopath in Naples or is there a good homeopath in LA? I'll say, I would go to somebody that has the CHC after their name. Because I know that they are a, you know, well-trained uh, homeopathic uh, practitioner. It will have CH what behind it? CHC. Okay. Uh, that would be. Uh, or no, CCH, I'm sorry, CCH. It's Certified Classical Homeopath. The organization is the Council of Homeopathic Certification. The organization is CHC. And you can go to their website and they can give you all the information on how to get your certifying exam. CHC. Council of Homeopathic Certification. But your credentials would be CCH, Certified Classical Homeopath. Thank you. And it's a national certification that is highly respected by any practic practicing homeopath. And that's typically a three-year education or just getting the hours in? Just get the hours in. Uh, but it's pretty tough to do it. You, I mean, if you're really ambitious, you could probably do it in a year. But I don't think you'd pass the test because a lot of it, this right. is a simulation. It's like you could, you know, go through all the text in medical school, but I don't think you're going to pass the board. So it takes a certain amount of absorption and digestion. Absolutely, for sure. So, okay, any other questions? Thanks, everyone. And I look forward to the next class. Make sure you schedule your 30 minutes with me. Okay. Have a, have a good week.